Okay, well, let's begin. Welcome to the University of Rhode Island uh, Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering 2012 Capstone Presentations. My name is Leon Thiem, Russ Morgan, a principal from GZA Incorporated, and I are the instructors for the Capstone Design Project. The goal of the Capstone course is to allow the students to apply the skills and knowledge learned in their first three years to this design project. The goal is not to produce a bid-ready design set of plans, but rather to work through the design process. The seniors in this course have been assigned the task of developing a parcel of land located on the waterfront in East Providence, Rhode Island. Mark Fisher, an architect and current URI pharmacy building project manager for Keogh Construction, has acted as the owner and developer of this site. He has requested that his East Providence parcel of land be developed as a destination site. He envisions that this development will require the locating and design of a restaurant, several boutiques, and an antique carousel. As part of the land development, the student engineers must address road and parking lot design, runoff collection and treatment where appropriate, wastewater disposal, and structural and foundation design. Because of the topography of the site, a retaining wall design will be necessary. Economic calculations were not a part of this project. To accomplish these tasks, five teams were formed. Each team has a leader as well as student engineers in each of the civil engineering disciplines. In the beginning of this semester, letters were written to major civil engineering consulting firms in Rhode Island requesting their assistance in mentoring the teams. During the middle of this semester, each of the five teams were paired with a civil engineering consulting firm. During the remainder of the semester, the teams met with their mentoring firms, either here at URI or in the offices of the consulting firms. All participants responded positively to this mentoring, and based upon their suggestions, we plan to start the mentoring at the beginning of the capstone sequence. Let me point out the, some representatives from the civil engineering consulting firms that were mentoring. Um, not all of them are present here. Sue Bach, Susan Barker, George Monahan, Mike Desmond are from Bryant Associates slash Steer Engineering. Robert Fairbanks is from Crossman Engineering slash Fairbanks Engineering. Len Bradley is from Dupreet Engineering Associates. Steve Baker and Mike Coogan from McGuire Group. Scott Lundgren from Power Corporation. And also in, uh, um, in attendance is Larry Smith. Um, Sheila McGovern joined us at lunch but couldn't make it for this presentation. And both of them are C CVE Advisory Board members. I would also acknowledge the assistance of Steve Cabral and George Ciadas, as well as the tireless assistance of John Steer, who seemed to be there in the capstone design room, maybe more than the students always, it seemed. So thank you, John. Each team will introduce themselves and have 25 minutes for their presentations. Five minutes will be allowed for questions. Those of you who are watching the presentations on the web may submit questions via email at civil at egr.uri.edu. We'll be monitoring that site. Again, it's civil at egr.uri.edu. The order of the presentations is Starkbau, Varsity Engineering, New England Engineering Design, Earthwide Engineering Enterprise, and Ocean State Engineering. I should also mention that judging sheets are available and we, uh, over here, and we encourage all to fill them out and turn them in, at least the, of the judges. So without some further conversation, let me um, turn it over to Starkbau, the first group. Thank you, Dr. Thiem. I'd like to thank all of you for attending this year's Capstone Design presentations. We are Stark Bow Engineering. My name is Mark Rijat. I'm sorry, hold on one second. My name is Mark Vijat. I was the project manager as well as assisted with the geotechnical engineering designs. Uh, Joe Pastor, one of the structural engineers. William Garcia, structural engineer. Stephanie Fairbanks, geotechnical engineer. Daniel Waugh, environmental engineer. Colleen Grinham, environmental engineer. William Seitz, Roman transportation engineer and CAD specialist. 
So this year's project was located off Veterans Memorial Parkway in East Providence. Uh, it was previously an industrial tank field owned by Chevron Corporation. As you can see, the entrance to the site is right over here. It's approximately one mile from the off-ramp of 195, Route 195, and it's also a half a mile from uh, Pierce Memorial Stadium, both of which can produce high volumes of potential customers for the site. The top of the site is located over here at an elevation of approximately 30 feet, and it slopes down to sea level, which, which caused some uh, issues uh, regarding requiring a lot of fill in order to make the site developable. We've had to build a revetment along the shoreline to protect the shore from erosion. Um, the FEMA flood zone maps indicate that in the water, the site is a V zone, and on land, it's an A zone. This implies that the flood elevation uh, is 16 feet per FEMA, and we have designed all buildings to an elevation of at least 18 feet to allow an additional factor of safety. An existing sewer line runs just below uh, the entrance to the site and uh, we'll be able to tie in all of our buildings into town sewage and electrical and water utilities are also available on site for tie-in. We're developing approximately 14 acres of land. Uh, as you can see, here's our proposed development. Um, the purpose of the development is to provide a recreational hub for the city of East Providence. We've relocated the, current, the existing bike path which previously ran a above the site to run along the coastline. This provides a quintessential venue for vendors such as Dell's Lemonade or uh, any other type of vendors to capitalize on the increased uh, biking traffic that will occur during the summer months along the coastline. We've also implemented a restaurant per the client's request over here which faces the waterfront to capitalize on the scenic water, water views. We've also developed four boutiques with the potential to add two more in the future. The two in the center will be left uh, empty for now and be if the client uh, desires to build them in the future, the space is allotted for that to happen. Finally, we've placed a carousel centrally located on the site, uh, which has been donated to the client. He requested that we implement this in the development, and uh, it will also capitalize on the waterfront views. The elevation issues I was uh, talking about earlier uh, have been addressed by building this retaining wall along the top of the site. Uh, what we did was run the access road from the top of the site and run, then run north and south along the top of the retaining wall to minimize the amount of space consumed by, uh, by the roadways. This maximizes the amount of developable space on the site, uh, which is a huge plus for the developer. Uh, to give you a better understanding of uh, each aspect of the uh, development. Each uh, member of the team will uh, describe a component of the development that they worked on, starting with what we believe to be the most profitable component, the restaurant. Uh, thank you, Mark. Once again, I'm Joe Pastor, one of the structural engineers. Uh, as Mark stated, one of what our design was based on was approximately 125 seats on the of interior space. We also had to have about 25 extra seats on the deck. This resulted in a square footage of about 4,000 square feet on the interior and another 600 square feet worth of deck. This is split up in a 60% dining space, 40% kitchen space, roughly. This changes a little bit because of bathrooms and bar areas and whatnot, but that's basically what we've got going on the inside. The entryway to the restaurant will be here from the main uh, development, which will be on, which is over on this side in this picture, and can either be just an easy set of doors going in this way, or we could add a portico type structure on the outside, depending on the client's uh, preferences. The waterfront is down to this direction, and all seating along this area nicely faces the waterfront, so we can utilize that area and those scenic views. Structurally, we'll start at the bottom. The, due to some soil issues, there is a deep foundation, pile foundation that the geotechs will get into a little bit later. On top of that rests a structural concrete slab. This slab is made of 4,000 PSI concrete. It's about 10 inches thick, exactly 10 inches thick everywhere. And there are T-beams integral in the slab. On top of that, we focused mainly on timber framing with one exception, which I'll get into in a minute. Timber framing allow, is a very familiar 
construction technique amongst many contractors, which will allow very competitive bidding, and it also lends itself to expedient uh, construction times. The uh, wind resistance, or not wind resistance, sorry, wind loads on this building are rather large. The this peak is about 30 feet in the air, so it is a large building, especially because this kitchen area was made to be completely open to make ease of placing equipment. Because of that, there will have to be a steel moment-resisting frame construct constructed in this large section of the building, which will resist those wind loads. This uh, low roof section here is framed with TGI, TJI uh, True Joist rafters, which are very common. They go up very quick. They're very light. If anybody's familiar with the product, it's really quite a wonderful product. The top roof is made of wood trusses. Wood trusses are provided by off-site manufacturers, which are local to the area. They are very an econ economical choice, and they go up incredibly fast, if anybody is familiar with that product. Um, now, we have prepared a little video, which will help introduce you to the architectural aspects of the building. This is a loose interpretation of what the building will look like. As you can see, it fits the classic New England style of cedar shingles on the top, clapboards on the bottom, if you can get past all the windows. We've added this round on the front to increase the architectural allure of the building. The river is down in this area, and you can see the deck is nicely situated so that all of the visitors to the building can sit, enjoy a drink, and have a great time at the restaurant. Now to get into the details of the boutique design, I'll hand it over to Bill. I'm William Garcia. I'm going to talk about the design of the boutique buildings, which are located to the east of the restaurant and the carousel. And as per request of the owner, four buildings will be constructed with an additional two planned for the future. Each building is 25 by 40 feet long, making a total square footage of 1,000 feet and 900, 900 of which being usable retail space. All structural elements were designed according to state and international building code and ASC 7. This building illustrates the rough aesthetics of the, of the boutique buildings including an exterior architecture to be designed by the contractor as per historic East Providence waterfront style. Each door faces outward with a view of the scenic Providence Bay Area, which can be seen through large windows located in every storefront. This diagram illustrates the main structural components of the boutique buildings. On top of the foundation wall lies a five inch slab on grade. Anchor bolts embedded within the slab edge are used to attach the bottom plate to the slab. All studs are to be two by sixes spaced 16 inches on center. Framing each window will be a double header and two jack studs. To satisfy wind and lateral loading requirements, seven sixteenth inch wood structural panel wall sheathing is to be fastened to the exterior studs. The roof system consists of two by eight inch rafters connected by <coughs> two by 10 inch rafter ties. These, ro these roofing elements will also be spaced 16 inches on center. As I mentioned before, uh, an antique uh, carousel has been donated to the client. We've decided to place this carousel as shown on the picture here um, to maximize the water, from, water views from the carousel without obstructing any of the other structures views of the waterfront. Uh, we, while the interior will be the donated carousel, we felt that it was important to protect the exterior of the carousel by building a structure similar to this, similar to this which will be constructed out of glass so that riders can uh, enjoy the waterfront views and it will also look appealing to uh, those who are not inside the structure. It shall be designed by the contractor and we feel that this um, carousel, which is located in Australia, depicts a similar style that should be implemented. Now one of the most important aspects of a structure is what's holding it up. Um, <clears throat> using, we were uh, 
test to design foundations for all the, rest the restaurant and all the boutiques using a combination of uh, historical data as well as provided consolidation curves, we were able to determine that the site is broken up into two subsurface conditions. Uh, underneath the restaurant is um, a layer of compressible silt and which will require uh, deep foundations and underneath the boutiques is a layer of sand and gravel which is adequate to support standard spread, spread footings which are shown here. Uh, the boutique foundations were designed to an allowable bearing pressure of 3,000 pounds per square foot, and they were designed to allow no more than one inch of total settlement and one quarter inch of, uh, one, excuse me, one half inch of differential settlement over 40 feet. Uh, the footings will sit on 12 inches of compacted structural fill, and they will be per placed on a firm, stable subgrade. The fill will extend a minimum of four inches beyond the edge of the footing. Beneath the restaurant, as I said, is compressible silt. Uh, settlement analysis indicated that the settlement will range from between 3 inches and 14 inches using uh, a range of historical data for the city of East Providence. Uh, we calculated this will take approximately 18 months to consolidate, which is too long. We figured it was too long to uh, allow for preloading. Therefore, we've designed for the use of H piles. We evaluated some alternatives and uh, concluded that driving timber piles over 60 feet is not realistic. Uh, we also considered pre-stressed concrete piles and steel pipe piles, but these alternatives uh, we feel would have a greater chance of being impacted by obstructions in the soil layers beneath the structure. Uh, therefore, the best alternative was using HP 10 by 42 uh, H piles with a 10 inch by 10 inch plate welded to the bottom of the uh, pile to provide end bearing capacity, and they will be driven to a depth of uh, ranging between 75 and 85 feet, depending on the location in the restaurant. Once again, I'm Steph. Um, one of the major uh, components of this site was the retaining wall, uh, which runs uh, in the north-south direction approximately where the old railroad tracks are located. This retaining wall supports the access roads to the north and south parking lots. Because of this, the wall was designed to hold a maximum load of what a tractor trailer truck would um, provide. The face of the wall itself will have a relief design in the formwork to provide the essence of a stone wall to match the um, architecture on the site. Uh, the wall was designed to be fully draining with six inch weep holes every 10 feet on center to avoid any hydrostatic pressure behind the wall itself. Um, we, ensured to we were insured to place the footing below the front below the minimum frost depth um, because the soil beneath the structure itself is not a fully draining soil. Um, we designed the wall itself in two separate sections for economic reasons. By doing this at the approximate half height we were able to cut the footing size in half and we reduced the amount of concrete that was wasted. The largest section was designed at the um, tallest, uh, the largest section was designed at the tallest height which is approximately where, I'll show you here, where um, the access road comes down and splits off in each direction. This section, the top elevation falls at approximately 31 feet and the bottom elevation falls at approximately 18 feet. The stem at this point is 15 feet tall and requires a nine foot footing. The footing thickness for both the tallest and the smaller section of the wall is two feet thick. The smaller section was designed at the approximate half height we used where the stem was going to be five feet tall. This footing was cut in half to approximately four and a half feet. Both sections of the retaining wall were designed for normal weight, 4,000 PSI strength concrete. Now our site obviously falls directly on the Providence River, so it was important to protect the shoreline with a riprap revetment. We designed the riprap revetment um, in accordance with the Army Corps of Engineers design guidelines, and we used the FEMA flood insurance study for the Providence County. According to the flood insurance study, our site falls within Transect 18. In Transect 18, we designed to the 100-year storm. For the 100-year storm, the annual still water level falls at approximately 15.2 feet using NAVD 88. The maximum annual 1% uh, annual chance wave crest is going to occur at 19 feet. Through the analysis, we determined that the um, wave height that we need to design to would be 4.2 feet tall. This wave is considered the H10 wave. 
The H10 wave means that 10% of the waves that can occur will be taller than the wave that we designed for. According to the Army Corps of Engineers, this is the appropriate wave height to use. This wave height will uh, occur at approximately an elevation of 18.1 feet, which is slightly above our maximum elevation. So there is a potential for overtopping of the structure, but it's minor and it's after evaluation we determine is not an issue. The revetment itself will be designed uh, with the maximum allowable slope of one and a half to one. This was necessary to accommodate the fact that the top elevation falls at 18 feet and the mean low water level is all the way down at negative 2.4 feet. The revetment was designed with three separate layers. Our primary layer ha is approximately four feet thick. It'll have two layers of an average of 1,200 pound stone. The second dairy layer falls directly below the primary layer. It's approximately two feet thick with two layers of approximately 80 to 120 pound stone. The bottom layer is a layer of geotextile fabric run all the way from the back down through the bottom. It is extremely important that we bury the toe of the revetment at least four feet below the mean low water level to ensure that there is no possibility of undermining of the structure and to avoid washing any rocks out. Hi, I'm Dan and I covered the surface water design. Um, as you can see, we have split the site into five different watersheds and each watershed drains into five different swales. Um, the swales are located on the top of um, ranges from east to west of our site. Um, each swale drains into a culvert on each side of the site and the culvert is then um, transported through pipes below our site into a level spreader. Um, and this ensures that there's no erosion on the shoreline. Um, these are open channel swales using riprap and we chose D, uh, class one um, rocks which have an average diameter of six inches. And um, you can see the cross section of our swale um, below on the picture. It's two foot on the bottom, eight feet on the top with a two to one slope. And that is a picture of one of the level spreaders that we plan to put in on the shoreline. For the surface water on site, um, we treated it using two different methods. The first is permeable pavement. It is able to store a, water, a certain amount of the water and treat it and infiltrate it back into the groundwater. We also chose underground infiltration trenches, and these were provided by StormTech, and they're the SC740 versions. Um, and they give a total storage volume of 4,500 cubic feet. And one of the major requirements is you need 310 tons of stone um, to, to build these trenches. And finally, we found that the CN value from our watershed that we developed uh, was previously six, uh, 71 and it dropped to 68 and this proved that we improved the site conditions um, through our surface water treatment. Once again, my name is Colleen Grinham and I was responsible for the sewage disposal lines. On site we have an existing line. It is a 24 inch diameter concrete line that runs from north to south. It's gravity fed and it's owned by the town of East Providence. We have lines coming from all of the boutiques. These two are mocked in to show the future flows but are not going to be in the first phase of construction. These lines are six inch diameter PVC SDR 35 with a minimum slope of one percent. There are clean out valves at the beginning of each of these lines to allow for easy maintenance. They will flow into a coordinating line that will go through a series of drop manholes to RIDOT specifications. They're made out of precast concrete four feet diameter. The restaurant will have an eight inch PVC pipe at schedule 40 and a grease tank will tie into that. The grease tank is designed to handle 50% of the restaurant's wastewater for a 24 hour retention. This will help settle all of the solids and let all the greases float to allow for easy treatment. The site is around 9,000 gallons per day, so 80% of that is coming from the restaurant, so that's a very large lo load. And we'll tie in with the manhole to the existing line, which is also a precast manhole, and it's doghouse style.
Hi, my name is Bill and I'm the transportation engineer on the site. Um, the main aspects of our site include a road coming down from the intersection with Lyon Avenue to the 308 intersection with one road running north into a larger parking lot which will service primarily the restaurant and also another access road going to a southern smaller parking lot which is for additional parking for the boutiques. Um, the major uh, aspects of this road the main road comes down, starts at an elevation of 56 feet, and ends at an elevation of 32 feet with a maximum grade of 8%. The two access roads start off at 32 feet, the one on the north ends at an elevation of 17 feet, and the one on the south ends at an elevation of 15 feet. Both those roads are kept to a maximum elevation of 15%. One of the largest concerns for safety in the transportation of this site is the large road with a steep grade coming straight down to the site. In order to mitigate any effects of a runaway truck, we will have a crash barrier installed in the five-foot gap between the road and the retaining wall, which will consist of extra strength guardrail and an earthen mound with buried jersey barriers. Um, the pavement that we used on the, uh, for the first road coming down from Veterans Memorial Parkway to the 3A intersection, we just used traditional bituminous concrete pavement. Um, the pavement will be designed to hold the capacity of a large truck as we expect large trucks to make deliveries to the restaurant boutiques. Um, the two smaller access roads and the parking lots will be constructed of permeable pavement. The permeable pavement will also be capable of withstanding the capacity of large delivery trucks. So the final focus of this project is on LEAD, Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. And this is something that we've held very close is environmental friendly practices and sustainable practices. So what we've done is our last boutique, our southernmost boutique, we've had LEED certified. We've gained 42 points, which is a LEED gold rating. This ranges from points in sustainable sites to energy and atmosphere. And we have gained one point in innovation and design process for having a LEED accredited professional LEED AP work with us on this project. So I'd like to highlight a few of the things that we've used on the site and have future plans for development for that have allowed us to be more sustain sustainable and environmentally friendly. First is that we've used water efficient landscaping and innovative wastewater technologies. This means that we've used local and indigenous species of plants such as swamp azalea, mountain laurel, trumpet honeysuckles, wild geraniums and the like to create less of a water demand and use less water from offsite. To treat this current irrigation and landscaping needs, we've added rain barrels to the last uh, boutique to allow for this landscaping. We've also used certified lumber from the Forest Stewardship Council. This means that this lumber can regr be regrown within 10 years, and that's important to help uh, decrease deforestation. We've used a local certified wood, which is the Douglas fir, and we'll be using that for our uh, timber framing. And for interior mater materials, we've suggested that they use other certified wood, such as bamboo. We've also gained many points in alternative transportation. We are within a half a mile from public transportation, the Ripton number 56 bus. We have provided for 5% of the permanent population bike racks. We've also included more for the new demand in biking due to the bike path. These bike racks are made out of 98% recyclable material. And we've also added specialty parking for fuel efficient vehicles to encourage people to bring those Priuses. One thing that we've decided to excuse me, as a future development is to focus on green power. And this site is per perfect to utilize geothermal loops. Geothermal energy uses the ambient temperature of the earth, which is approximately 55 degrees Fahrenheit, to heat and cool air from the building as necessary. In this case, our combination of being a new construction, being so close to a large body of water, the Providence River, and having the protection of the proposed pier design makes it optimal for an open loop system. This open loop system, also called a groundwater or surface water heat pump, will utilize this body of water, much like the earth, to cool and heat the water needed to change the air temperature within the boutique. The water is then returned to this body of water to come back up to temperature and recharge as necessary. And using the Providence River as our water source, we've eliminated some of the most common problems with open loop systems, which is draining or contaminating a natural aquifer. And although cost analysis and payback period analysis should be investigated before something like this is installed, 
We see this as an optimal environment and a great site to install this type of alternative energy, and geothermal loops should be seriously considered on site. In conclusion, we were able to meet all of the client's requests. <clears throat> we were able to, uh, for the waterfront development, we relocated the bike path to run along the coastline of the uh, site. We've designed a scenic waterfront restaurant. We've designed four boutique shops and left the room for two additional in the future. And we've included the waterfront carousel on site. We went above, above and beyond these re initial requests by achieving a LEED Gold certification. This is a huge marketing advantage in today's expanding green culture. We were able to enhance the community by adding usable space to Rhode Island's waterfront, and we expect that this project will significantly boost East Providence tourism potential. We'd like to give special thanks to all the consultants who have helped us uh, accomplish this project. Um, without them, we wouldn't have been able to accomplish what we have, uh, namely Steve Cabral, Rick Carlone, Robert Fairbanks, Mark Fisher, Russell Morgan, John Steer, uh, Richard St. Jean and Professor Thiem. We really appreciate all the help you've done, and without you, this wouldn't have been possible. We'll now be happy to take any questions and or job offers that you guys may have. <laughs> yes? A few questions. I think it was Mr. Pesco. It seems you have a complete window in the wall on that restaurant. Yes. Facing the wind. The province. The dominant wind direction. You can see the Newport Bridge from that location at night. Excellent. And that's a tough trick to do with a window wall at the hurricane. It's just there. You may have to end up spacing them out, having solid walls between. Uh, the that the microphone. Excellent. To be perfectly honest, that may have been a uh, an artistic rendition of the building. If you if you consult with the plans, there's yes, one or two less windows than that. Oh, and the, also in the, in the plans there was uh, strapping specified. And the kitchen seemed, did you consult anything for the kitchen size proportion to the restaurant? It seems disproportionately large. It does look rather large. We did find recommendations, as I mentioned earlier, that 60% of the seating area should, or the major the entire seat area of the building should be 60% seating and 40% kitchen. So we went with that, even though it did work out, I believe the kitchen was a little bit smaller. But there is kitchen, uh, the kitchen size was considered for the deck seating as well, so it may look disproportionately large. But, and the bathroom takes up a little bit of that space too. Gentlemen on the road grades, what was the maximum grade on the Eight percent coming down, and five percent on the two side roads. So we kept it. We kept the maximum grade to five percent in all permian pavement. For just one final note: East Providence has the roof carousel at Creston Park, less than a mile away. It was a long civic battle lawsuit. It's run by a community group. If you were to propose this, I know they told you to put it in. It wouldn't be DOA. <laughs> Yes, we were asked to do that by the client's request, so we included it in the design. <laughs> Mark's very persuasive. <laughs> okay, any other questions for this group? No? Okay, thank you very much. Oh, oh there is one question. Uh, uh, nice presentation. I just had a, a quick couple of questions. I didn't see a contour map until like 16 minutes into the presentation, so it was hard to tell from your very early slides until that, that point. Are you bringing in a lot of fill here? A lot of fill, yes. Mm -hmm. We're so are you talking all site. about uh, fill volumes or quality of fill, compaction specs? The quantity and, and details are listed in, in the uh, details of the plans. Um, I'd have to check for the exact quantity, but they are But you've got to bring in a lot of fill. Yes, a lot. It is a significant um, amount, but it's, it, it's going to bring a lot to the table mm -hmm. for uh, profit-wise, so we think that it's worth it to have the, the site developable by bringing in that fill. I also didn't see, uh, you, you mentioned that there were organic silts beneath the restaurant, mm -hmm. but then you said sand and gravel beneath the boutiques. Yes. So how does the soil, how do the soils, how do you know the soils changed so drastically? We were provided with some consolidation curves, um, and then for 
beneath the boutiques and also provided with historical data from uh, Professor Naki, actually, who um, that for some ranges of the soils beneath the, the compressible soils beneath the restaurant. So we designed uh, per those uh, specifications. But you don't have soil profiles? We do have soil profiles. They may not have been pre presented in the, uh, the PowerPoint, but they are in the plan set. Uh, there's uh, a, boring, a bunch of boring logs as well as soil profiles running through the site. There's three profiles that we ran. Last question. This, this looks like awful lot like a brown field. Right. There any it was previously right. remediated, so, so clean, we're all clean. clean. So yeah. It's delivered to you clean. Yes. Yeah. It's East Providence. It's clean. Clean. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, the next group is Varsity. All right. uh, hello and thank you for your time. My name is Miss Al Sanchez and I'm uh, the project manager for uh, Varsity Engineering. And this is the uh, development on the Providence River waterfront. Our group consists of myself, the team leader, uh, Michael Pizzullo on transportation, uh, Nick uh, Alfred on structures, as well as Nick Romano on structures. Curtis Wheatley will be uh, talking about the geotech. Marlon worked on the uh, wastewater, and Maria worked on surface water. So just an overview of what we'll be talking about <laughs> is just site details. Uh, we'll get into the transportation aspect of it, structural, uh, the geotechnical, the wastewater, and as well as the surface water. So as you can see here, um, our, our site is located right on the Providence River, which is, uh, allows for very good views for uh, the, the customers who decide to come. And it's right off of Veterans Memorial Parkway, which is a main, a main uh, road in East Providence. Uh, some existing conditions. It was an old Chevron site, so uh, there used to be uh, oil containers on it. Um, one of the main issues we had to deal with was the this uh, grade differential from the main road down to the site, and um, because of that, we were we were forced to. Uh, where is it? 
we were forced to move the, uh, the road and uh, curve it from the uh, original orientation off of Lion Ave. And another problem that we faced was that, according to the FEMA regulations, the whole site was underneath flood zone. So we were, uh, we were forced to fill in to about elevation 17 from water level. And so this is the proposed plan. The developer asked us to create a restaurant that seats about 125 uh, with outdoor seating for the warmer weather. And along with that, he, he wanted us to, that's the restaurant there, and he wanted us to create uh, boutiques, about 1,000 square foot each. So we created two with the, uh, with the spots there for future uh, development. And like the group before us stated, uh, he also included a carousel, which we put here, which lines up directly with the wharf that we included so that people who come and uh, bike riders that pass by might want to stop and take a look on the Providence River. And speaking of the bike path, we were also <laughs> forced, uh, we were asked to relocate the bike path along the, the coastline from the original position, which was on Veterans Memorial Parkway. And now I will leave you with uh, Mike Pizzullo and the transportation aspect. As I mentioned, I'm Mike, and I'm going to talk about transportation. And the main parts of, parts of transportation I'm going to talk about are the access road, the bike path relocation, and the parking lot design. Um, this is a proposed location for the roadway. Uh, we initially tried to have the roadway come straight into the site, but the elevation at Veterans Memorial was 60 feet, and the elevation at the bottom was 17, and we determined that the slope was going to be greater than the 8% maximum designated by ASHTO. So through trial and error, we implemented two curves onto the site, our radius 150. And we decided to have a design speed of 15 miles an hour. And we made sure that the curves were sufficiently wide enough in case you're going 20 miles an hour too to account for speeding. Um, this is more details of the dimensions of the curve. Uh, the bottom drawing shows the inside and outside edge, the lengths of each segment. And the top one is the center line distances. Uh, and then we compared the uh, proposed roadway elevation versus the existing. And as you can see, uh, this slope here is 8%, so almost the entirety of the road is 8%. And you can see that there's two sections of the existing site that are much, much steeper than 8%. So as a result, there was really no way to get around having one large section of fill right here, which is maximum height of 14 feet, and one large section of depth of cut, which is 15.2 feet. And this is a typical cross-section that we determined using ASHTO. Um, calls for 15 feet travel each direction with 12 feet designated for the travel lane and 3 feet designated for the shoulder. And then we used East Providence regulations for a granite curb on the edge. Uh, initially, we determined the pavement structure according to ASHTO, um, ASHTO standards. But then we got regulations for East Providence, so we used those instead. So these are the East Providence regulations. Uh, it calls for three inches of asphalt concrete split up into an inch and a half of surface course type I-1 and an inch and a half of binder course, followed by six inches of crushed stone and nine inches of gravel base. And next I'm going to talk about the bike path. Um, uh, currently, the bike path travels along Veterans Memorial Parkway up here. However, RIDOT has requested that anybody developing along the river relocate the bike path along the water for better views and more scenic. So this is the proposed new location of the bike path. Um, I consult, uh, we consulted with a resident engineer who recently comp completed uh, an extension on the South County bike trail. So these um, picked up a plan set from them, and these are the uh, ride out standards for bike paths. Uh, it calls for a 12-foot bicycle path with three feet of shoulder at least on each side. And the shoulder is at a total one slope, and it can either be gravel or um, plentiful soil borrow. So we decided on the side away from the water sloping down to the bike path. We would use gravel to prevent like uh, mud and stuff from washing onto the bike path. And then on the side toward the water, we decided to use plentiful borrow to encourage more water to seep into the ground and less runoff. And this is, uh, again, according to RIDOT standards. It calls for four inches of asphalt concrete with an inch and a half of wearing course type I2 and, in, and two inches of uh, type I1 followed by 12 inches of gravel barrel subbase and three inches of stabilized aggregate. And then lastly, I'm going to talk about the parking lots. Um, as I mentioned, we have two parking lots on our site. 
parking lot A and parking lot B. Uh, this is at the north end, and this is at the south end. Um, we mentioned before that the elevation of the entire site is at 17 feet. However, we have um, slight variation down to 16 and a half feet here and here and along here in the parking lots. That um, allows a 1% grade in the parking lot, which uh, will prevent, uh, encourage drainage and prevent ponding on the, in the lots. And we decided to use permanent pavement to reduce the amount of runoff from the site. And using standards, we determined that it should be four inches of porous asphalt, two inches of choker course, four inches of base, and 14 inches of sub-base. And next, Alfred Rodriguez will talk to you about structural design. Hello, my name is Alfred Rodriguez. Together with Nick Romano, we're going to walk you through uh, some of structural design as well as some of the architectural aspect of this project. First of all, we were asked by the owner to provide a, a restaurant. Uh, this is the schematic that we came up with. Um, basically, a 70 by 70 feet uh, restaurant um, uh, with capacity to fit 125 people with inside and outdoor seating. Um, as you can see here, we have, in the layout, we put a kitchens, we have a storage area down over here. We also include our loading area, a dumpster area, an HPC area to, um, blocked from the view of the customers. Um, as you can see here, we have the, the entrance door, which is facing parking lot B, uh, as Mike as Mike Pesulo mentioned, and then we have another door facing the walkway and 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 the the car the carousel. Another key feature that the owner asked us to provide was a uh, uh, space and and uh, maximize the view to the to the river. So this is the west side facing the river. With as you can see, we try to put large windows in, and uh, also as uh, in the entrance of the of the restaurant. We were also asked to design two boutiques, 1,000 1, square foot boutiques with expansion for two more. This one didn't, we didn't have any requirements as far as windows and, and space, but this is the, the layout that we came up with. We put a storage area, fitting rooms, and uh, also a restroom. To carry out the, the structural design, we first had to look at some um, design requirements. So we looked at the Rhode Island State Building Code um, Edition 10 as far as determining the loads that we were going to use to uh, to design our structure, we use ASCE 705. As far as our wind load, we used um, the wind uh, the wind velocity in Rhode Island, and we followed the procedures on ASCE 705 to come up with the wind pressures and and direction that the wind was going to be applied, as well as the factors. Uh, as far as that low, we, we used um, roof materials such as light feeding, um, light fixtures, and insulation to come up with, 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 with 15, P, uh, 15 PSF. Uh, minimum roof life and snow were determined by code. As far as use and occupancy classification, our building, we came up that our building is, is classified as category two, which means it's not of low hazard to human life neither of a high loss or hazard or, or nor an essential building. And now I'm going to leave you with Nick Romano, which is going to walk you through some of the design process. How you doing? I'm Nick Romano. As Alfred mentioned, I'm going to just briefly go through the uh, structural design process. Both our structures are designed from the roof down. And with those design loads that Alfred just, just mentioned, uh, we selected um, steel deck and joists that would satisfy those loads in our, in our span using a manufacturer's catalog. Uh, some noteworthy assumptions too as, as far as our structures go, we have a building height of 20 feet as well as we will be sloping the roof with the rigid insulation. As far as the selection goes for the structural framing, we use steel and we use STAD to model and select these members. As you can see here at the bottom, we have the 3D rendered views uh, and output from STAD. 
We also used some finite element analysis, which is, was used to model the steel deck here you see in pink, which acts as a diaphragm and, 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 and um, transfers that lateral load. Um, all designs were done per ASD or unfactored loads for the, for the reason that we'd be able to have those loads provided to the geotechnical engineer to, to perform a bearing capacity analysis and, and design our foundations. Um, also, our max deflections for our members were, were limited to a span over 360. So with a selected geometry and an uh, iterative process, we attempted to select the least weight uh, structural members for, for both the restaurant and the boutique. Uh, as you can see here, for our columns, we, we decided to select HSS, HSS columns. Um, for our girders and wind bracing, we use wide flange sections. And for our hangers and cross bracing, we just, uh, chose angles. And as far as the boutique goes, it's relatively the same geometry and same process, slightly smaller sections, but still uh, hollow steel columns, uh, wide flange sections for the girder and, and wind bracing, and also angles for the hangers and, and cross bracing. Now Curtis is going to talk to you about the subsurface conditions and the geotechnical design. My name is Curtis Wheely. I'm going to talk about the geotechnical aspects of this project. Here is a picture of all the boring location plant, boring logs that were given to us for use in this project. Uh, this project required us to come up with three uh, cross sections. Here you can see cross section AA, which goes from east to east to west, and cross section B, uh, BB, which goes from north to south. And there's the third cross section, which is not on here, to CC. It goes from east to west over here, and it kind of uh, almost extends into the water. The main cross section that was used for the for the design of foundations and retaining walls was the was BB. It has an average ground elevation of 15 feet. Like I said before, through cross section. Here is a the north the north section of the cross section. As you can see, there is a substantial amount of fill on top. Some sand, sandy silt, silty clay, and glacial fill out wash on the bottom. My uh, in our analysis of the foundation design, we uh, I would recommend that you, we would excavate that fill and, and uh, go up to the elevation that we need, which is 17 feet, and uh, excavate it with uh, a, a good material that can that is that's well well drained and can uh, support the foundation design. The foundation design, for, we use the Stad Foundations, which is part of the Bentley Suite. It's an extension on the Stad finite element analysis that Nick and Alfred used. For, for uh, both boutique and restaurant, four, uh, four footings were, were, were needed in each corner of the building. This was to give maximum space inside, inside, the, um, inside the buildings themselves. And there's a limitation within STAD that it can only analyze foundations, uh, combined foundations, that, combined spread foundations that are linearly. So as you can see here, to analyze the four foundations, stead foundations need to break it up into two. You can see this is the, the geometry of the restaurant and of the boutique. It's just same elevations, and here are all the, uh, the dimensions. And uh, for the retaining wall design, we used RAM elements. It's, part, it's another program within the Bentley suite. And there's two retaining walls, one east and one west, the west being the larger of the two the height of 22 feet, which is illustrated here. The backfill material and the foundation material was selected to be a uh, free draining material, so it's uh, not susceptible to frost for, uh, for, for, ease, for ease of use. And, uh, and for design purposes, we chose, we, we, uh, we selected a 200 uh, kip foot load on top to, to um, simulate snow, snow load from snow plows being from snow being piled up on top of that from the exist from the existing uh, the the adjacent site excuse me and the ram elements uh, analyzed the steel aspects of the retaining wall which is this the output that it gave us for the west retaining wall this is only the steel requirements the temperature or, or tension seal was not taken into account next uh, Marlon Mendoza is going to talk about the sanitary sewers uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today, I'm going to walk you through the sanitary and the sewer water on our treatment. We did some research, and we found that we have an existing sewer main on our on our site, and this site is nine feet below the sixth grade, 
and, and it's a 24 diam inch diameter pipe. And this pipe is made out of clay and it's just a water uh, gravity system. And what we're gonna propose is uh, eight, eight, well, several eight inch diameter uh, PVC pipes and four manholes. These manholes are gonna consist of three conventional manholes and one doghouse manhole. And we're gonna propose uh, manholes whenever we change horizontal alignment and then uh, the manholes are gonna be, they cannot be more than 300 feet apart. And this picture uh, you can see, or plan, you can see our sewer main run, running through our site. And here you can see a closer view of how we're gonna have set up our system. In here you can see our three uh, conventional manholes and the dog house connecting to the sewer main. Also, we're gonna propose, propose clean out, which is gonna be along the lateral sewer line, and this is gonna be uh, the owner's responsibility. And this is basically the purpose of the uh, clean out is just to uh, remove any cloggage on our system. And as you can see, we're gonna locate it in the back of the restaurant because this is where we don't know any FOG coming out, and if we get anything uh, stuck in there, we need an, uh, an instant access to unclog it. We also are gonna design a grease trap uh, design for FOG, and this basically is gonna be located in the under, underneath of the sink. And we also, as I mentioned before, we're gonna design for the, our water system, and as I mentioned before, we also did some research on the site, and we discovered that there is this uh, water main on our site, and the water main is seven feet below our the system grain, and it's a 12-inch diameter pipe, this is also made out of clay, and this is also a gravity uh, system. But what we're gonna propose for these for our system is H, di eight inch diameter iron ductal pipes, and this pipe, uh, just for regulation uh, case, they have to be 10 feet away from the sewer system. And here is a picture of our water main, sorry, our uh, plant for our water main. This is our water main, and basically, as you can see here, this is our system, and we created it as a loop, so we don't have any uh, water uh, that, can, can, that can be uh, like a storage in one of the pipes and become as a contaminated water. We also found that there is this stone water on site, and it's a 12-inch PVC, and this is located along the entrance of our site. Uh, and for this, we're gonna propose a graded cash basins, and why? Because it optimizes hydraulic efficiency, bicycle, and pedestrian safety. And we choose this type of uh, cash basin because it's economic and it's free from, from clogging. And now, Maria Voltaire is gonna talk, about, gonna talk to you about the surface water. Hey everyone, my name is Maria. As Marlon said, I'm gonna talk to you about the surface water control. Uh, so for our site, uh, we are to assume that uh, the adjacent property, the water, the runoff needs to be controlled. And as required by the owner, we were asked to design a swale for the adjacent property. Uh, this, uh, and then for our site, we decided to have a chamber system, uh, as you can see in, the, um, in plan view. Uh, we calculated the flows uh, for this site using a program WinTR55. Uh, so the first thing that I'm gonna to talk to you about is the swell design. Uh, we use a 10 year design storm and then we calculated the flows using WinTR55 uh, and we chose to have a, a trapezoidal geometry for this. Uh, for this design, we couldn't use a program because there's no program to do soil dimensions. So we decided to use Excel in which we had to use Manning's equation and through an iterative process, we had to, um, we had to meet uh, Rhode Island DEM requirements for a velocity of five feet per second, uh, we use Manning's equation, and then we finally got, uh, you know, our, our soil profile uh, with a with a bottom width of eight of eight feet and then twelve flinch. Now, um, for for the flows, when we calculated the flows, we obtained that our pre-existing condition flows were less than our post-existing condition. Uh, I'm sorry, post-development conditions were higher. So this is, uh, this is the areas uh, how we decided to have an underground uh, infiltration system. We did this because the parking lot is at a 1% uh, 
slope. Uh, so we decided to split the areas into two, as you can see um, from the plan. Uh, area number one is on the north side of the site, in, located in parking lot A, and then area two, which is also part of the road, was calculated with flows for, uh, for the second area, for the second chamber, so we have two chambers. And this was recommended by, um, by our, our company, so that's why we decided to split it into two. Uh, this is a, a cross-section of the underground infiltration system, and it's supposed to be 18 inches below surface pavement. And these are the results uh, we obtained from doing calculations. We decided to use the StormTech SC740, and for the two separate areas, we got different flows. Uh, the area one having the you know smaller storage volume than area two because area two is taking into account the road which is impervious. And this concludes the end of the surface water control. So now Ms. Al is going to wrap it up for us. All right. This concludes our uh, presentation, and we feel that uh, we've done the best job we could with this project in accordance to the the codes and regulations that govern our site. And we, uh, we enjoyed the project and we feel that it uh, bridged the gap between the four years that we've been here and what we will, be, we, we will be experiencing when we go out into the real world. And it was a pretty, it was a pretty good experience to, to get hands on like that. And uh, I just wanted to thank uh, Par Corporation for their assistance during the project as well as GZA. And we also wanted to thank the URI College of Engineering staff that assisted us. And I wanted to personally thank my group for their hard work and dedication to finishing this project. And we will take questions. Yes? The bike path is being relocated down from Veterans Memorial Park. But where do you connect back? Um, the bike path uh, goes along Veterans Memorial, <laughs> then at the. Let me go back to a plan. The bike path comes from up here, and it actually already existing comes back down. So the bike path will actually meet back in where, where it's already existing. So on your property? Yeah, right, right at the edge of our property. On your property? Yeah, it, our property extends a little bit more onto here. It's just there's nothing developed there. And the other way when you storm set this, they, those lengths you're giving yeah. to walk along runs for a storm set. So 330 feet, can we go to the side? This one? The storm water? All this. This one? He's gone. That's the the storm surface. You go on. This one? No. No. That way. Okay. You're talking about the number of rows, but you have lengths of 330, 382 feet. Yeah, that's just the way um the uh, the storm tech has a, a calculator sheet, and they calculate how many uh, rows you're gonna have and how wide, you know, how wide it's gonna be. And then that's a very long distance. Yes. You're feeding it in. And typically, what happens is you have creeping failure. Of course, in the lesser storms, you're not even filling the whole thing. You just keep blowing the front. So you intend to normally have more rows, but shorter. Uh, to the structural team, I noticed you used a pretty fancy software package to do your structural analysis. Did you did you do any kind of hand calculations or any other method to, to check to make sure you're getting a reasonable reasonable answers? As far as the selection of uh, members, sure. Um, no, no hand calculations were done for that. The hand calculations were mainly for the uh, loads. Um, once we have the loads, we model the structure and put all, all those hand calculations with those loads and let STAD uh, select those appropriate numbers for us. We did, I mean, there's, we have tons of output that, you know, you can check that and um, check those numbers. 
you know, as far as hand calculations, that it's it's pretty involved. Um, so we, we let the let the computer program uh, design those numbers. So, in your experience with your consulting firms, do they do they run these models and, and don't do any hand checks with it? Do they have complete faith in the answer well, from the c computer program? Well, no, but they do know how to interpret the uh, the output. So, um, yeah, there are there are calculations that can be done to, to check those numbers. Um, as far as as far as this project and these members, we we um, use that. These perform calculations in terms of checking for deflections and things like that. And the numbers, because at first we weren't trusting too much the deflection that the, that the computer program was giving us. But after we check, we, we run it again and we, we try different methods. Curtis, I have a question about the retaining wall. The, um, you, you used this program to design the structural part of it. Yeah. How did you count? Did you check it for uh, stability, overall stability? Yeah, the the, pro the program checked checked for uh, the beta for sliding, overturning, and, uh, and and bearing, and I and I, I did some hand calculations or like some quick some quick uh, back of the envelope calculations to make sure that the steel was uh, adequate and and, uh, and I also checked that if, if I was getting the same bearing capacity, and for all those calculations I used. Uh, very, I used the highest factor of safety just because I wasn't uh, because of the uncertainty of the program. I wasn't sure, but I, I did, I did put, I did put a lot of faith into the program. But I, I did some quick little checks. Did you calculate earth pressures on your own? Uh, yes and no. We, we, when we first started, we were doing it by hand. Then we discovered this program, so we used we, the same, uh, the same material we used in our hand calculations. We plugged it into the program, and the program calculated the earth pressure for us. And just assume that it was the same. Hopefully, or so we just assumed that it was the same as the as what we were getting by hand. So, what did you use for horizontal earth pressures? How did you calculate this? Uh, ranking earth pressures. Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. The program uh, program allows you to select it. That yeah, program allows you to select which which uh, which, uh, which 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 way to use it, and it, we chose ranking. Next is New England Engineering Design, NEED Engineering. Good afternoon. We are New England Engineering Design, and we would first like to thank the college and all the other judges, and as well as the rest of the student body for coming here today. My name is Matt Caulfield. I was the team leader, and we are here to present our project, and we will first give you a brief overview of the existing site. 
Our site is highlight, highlighted here in yellow. It's located in the city of East Providence on the east side of the Providence River. Directly across from our site is the Port of Providence. So we had to deal with this when coming up with our site layout. This is a view of the pre-existing site conditions. As you can see, as two distinctive tiers, a lower one here and an upper here. We were tasked with developing on this lower site here. It was formerly owned by Chevron and used as a tank farm, so it was tiered for the storage of their products. Located here is the roadway Veterans Memorial Parkway, which has an elevation of 56 feet. And down on our site, the drop, elevations dropped to sea level and some on the grounds were as low as eight feet. This provided a challenging aspect in coming up with the roadway access as well as our different site layout options. This moves to show the pre-existing pier, which is cited for demolition, and we have also proposed a different pier design, which has gone into our site plans. Seen at the top here is the view of downtown Providence, which we are trying to incorporate into our site layout for the use of our restaurant design, as well as boutiques. This picture is taken at the intersection of Lions Ave and Veterans Memorial Parkway. Directly across from you, you can see the previous entrance gate, which was used by Chevron. This will also be the same entranceway that we are using for our project. We decided to come up with a few project goals so that we had some benchmarks to hit. These involve developing a commercial site with an effective layout, having an efficient park and parking and roadway layout, having an effective stormwater management plan as well as our wastewater design. We're also tasked with redesigning the existing concrete retaining wall as well as replacing the existing shoreline revetment. We also were supposed to design two keynote elements being the boutiques as well as restaurants, so we had to design them structurally as well as their foundation design. I'm just going to briefly introduce the team to you before we move into our individual design elements. As before mentioned, I am the project manager. Joe White was our AutoCAD specialist. Sean Mackey did our environmental engineering work. Ken Buteau and Pat Freeman were our geotechnical specialists. Nat Toby focused on our transportation design, and Jack Keating was our structural specialist. Next, I would like to give the podium to Joe White. As Matt said, my name is Joe, and I'm just going to take you through a quick um, overview of our site layout. Um, after conferring with our client, we decided we want to take advantage of the views of the waterfront uh, site that we have by creating an aesthetically uh, pleasing destination with strong sight lines up towards the city of Providence, which is in this direction, and then out uh, into the, uh, the harbor in this direction. So starting at the top of the site up here is Veterans Memorial Parkway. As you come down to our restaurant, which is located right here, it's a single story structure with uh, stone siding and features indoor and outdoor seating. And then as you move over here, we have two proposed boutiques of 1,000 square feet each, and they're positioned to create a um, like open space with outdoor seating as well as uh, which also encompasses area for our carousel, anti-carousel. And we also have location for two proposed future boutiques if our client would decide to pursue that in the future. Uh, moving down to our bike path, which is relocated to the, uh, closer to the shoreline of our site. And uh, that's adjacent to a proposed pier, which we combine as like a pier boardwalk type structure to uh, leave enough space for both pedestrians and vendors and also maintain the, the sight lines that we tried to design for. Um, with a waterfront site such as ours, there's many regulations to adhere to, one of which is FEMA. Um, FEMA regulates that we have a uh, flood zone of 16 feet, so all buildings must be at least at elevation. And uh, we graded our site to meet that 16-foot requirement as well as to meet ADA regulations which uh, limit us to a maximum 3% slope for parking lots and walkways. Uh, basically, our site is graded uh, on a 20-foot plateau for our buildings, and that tapers off um, around the edges of that plateau to help collect storm water into uh, various collection devices. Now I'd like to introduce Sean Mackey for stormwater overview. Hi, I'm Sean Mackey, and I was in charge of the environmental engineering for the site. Uh, as you can see here, this is our drainage overview for the entire site. For the top tier, we decided to take the uh, 17 cubic feet per second runoff output and put it into two pipes on each side of the road. 
The pipes are 24 inches in diameter and are made of concrete. They uh, will run the water down so they can drain around the sides of our site, not interrupt, interfere with that, uh, attractions on the site, and drain into the river. The other stormwater management devices we use on the site are rain garden, permeable asphalt, and three tree filters. The first uh, device we use is this permeable asphalt, which is 16,000 square feet and it has a three, roughly 3% 3 slope to meet ADA. This is a typical cross session taken from the Rhyland Stormwater Manual of uh, permeable pavement. We decided to go for the upper limits of a 12 inch filter layer to uh, ensure that the first, first flush pollutants are filtered out. And we also decided to go with an 18 inch reservoir layer for maximum sediment capture. For the rain garden, this main use was for catch basin drainage along the site. As you can see here with the black dots and then drain into a rain garden as depicted here that is about 1,700 square feet with a two foot basin. It is also equipped with an uh, overflow that leads into a 12 inch perforated pipe to be infiltrated through the ground. The final device we use is a tree filter that is used for the overflow, possible overflow of, a, of the permeable asphalt in these series of connected by 12 inch PVC. Also the tree filters are used for the snow pile area right here used used for the piling of snow that will melt into this for sediment capture to reduce pollutants into the environment. This tree box is six feet by six feet in area and has, is filled with bioretention soil and a tree of indigenous tree to the area. It also has an overflow device that leads into 12 inch perforated pipe to be infiltrated. For our wastewater system, we designed a 12 inch PVC pipe system that is gravity fed. We designed it for, these, for the loads depicted here of 100 gallons a day for each boutique and 5,000 gallons a day for the restaurant. According to DEM regulations, the restaurant must have a grease trap, which we designed here at 20 gallons per minute, adhering to this flow. This entire pipe network leads into the Fort Hill interceptor that is located here that runs north to south. It is a 24-inch concrete main owned by the city of East Providence. To do this, we use a drop manhole junction, as depicted here, that also has a safety feature of overflow to prevent from any environmental spills. Now I'm going to hand it off to Ken for the geotech. Thank you, Sean. <clears throat> Excuse me. My name is Ken Butel, and I'll be going over. I'll be going over the first par portion of the geotechnical design. Um, the main codes we used were ASCE 32 from 2001 and ACI 318 from 2005. Uh, we'd like to thank GZA and Dupree Engineering for supplying us with the information we, were, we needed in order to create these designs which we feel are the optimal for this site configuration. As you can see here, this is a soil, soil profile created running along the length of the site. This profile was chosen because it included all three structure types. Um, as you can see, there are three main soil strata. The first and top layer was a sand and fill um, mix. Inside of this sand and fill strata, there was a uh, clay deposit. This was only found in Boring 38. Um, due to this, we decided to remove it in order to uh, eliminate any long-term long settlements due with clay consolidation. The middle layer was a silt layer. Um, this will be further addressed in more detail momentarily. And the bottom layer was another sand layer. Now, again, highlighted in blue is this silt layer, which would cause the uh, settlements. Um, once the um, structural loads were known, the uh, total surcharge stresses were calculated for each structural type. Um, for the restaurants, it resulted in a total settlement of 2.1 inches. Um, the boutiques resulted in a total settlement of 0 0.9 inches. And the retaining wall, um, actually, yeah, there is a current retaining wall on the site. However, we do not know how heavy it is or the soil properties underneath it. So to be conservative, we decided to not um, to just assume that there was no settlement in the silt due to this current loading conditions. So after uh, our applied, our, um, excuse me, after our proposed retaining wall design, the applied loads resulted in a retaining wall settlement of 1.4 inches. Next, I'm going to hand it off to Pat to finish up the geotechnical design. Ken, I'm Pat Freeman and I'm going to be going over the retaining wall design and the footing designs. Uh, as you can see here, this is the existing retaining wall that's on the site. It's been vandalized and it's in disrepair, so we're going to remove that and uh, excavate the soil behind it. 
Um, this gives us the liberty to choose the fill material that we're going to use for the design of the retaining wall, which gives us a few liberties. Uh, this is the proposed retaining wall. As you can see here, it's 17, 17 feet tall. We chose a uh, fill material of uh, unit weight 130 pounds per cubic foot with a friction angle of 30 degrees. Um, because we use this free janning material, ASCE 32 allows us to raise the footing level above frost depth and make the wall shorter, therefore less expensive to build. This is an image of the uh, steel reinforcement for the concrete retaining wall. Um, it's designed for shear moments as well as shrinkage of the concrete during curing. Um, we chose to use shallow footings for uh, the uh, design of for the um, structures because both the subgrade material is fairly stable and the structures aren't that heavy. Um, this next image shows the steel reinforcement for the uh, um, footings. The base uh, right along the bottom is for design strength and shrinkage along the top. Um, due to the wide variety of loads given by the structural engineer, we designed four separate footings to deal with variable uh, load cases. And we figured this would be more economical than designing one overly designed footing or us in each individual uh, footing for each individual column load. Um, I'm going to hand it off to Matt uh, to discuss the uh, revetment design. <coughs> Thank you, Pat. Being a coastal site, it was necessary for us to raise and redesign our coastal revetment to our new height of 16 feet. Our, our new design had a horizontal one to two slope and using the FEMA coastal construction manual, we yielded a design wave height of four feet. Our primary armor layer thickness shown here had a thickness of four feet and a median stone size of a one foot diameter. Beneath it is an intermediate stone layer that is eight inches thick and is composed of R2 RIDOT graded riprap. Beneath that at the sub base layer is another eight inch layer of half inch crushed stone. Next, I would pass the, like to pass the podium to Matt. Thanks, Matt. Hi, I'm Matt Toby. I was responsible for the transportation design aspects of this project. <coughs> Our roadway was designed using the goals to limit the paved area and uh, minimize the walking distance from our par parking locations to our buildings. The design requirements for the project were to uh, <coughs> allow access for emergency vehicles and a Cisco truck to supply the restaurant. The Cisco truck is modeled by a W50 design vehicle <coughs> and it supplies the restaurant as mentioned. The boutique shops over here will be supplied by uh, box trucks. In the site layout you can see the sidewalk from Veteran Memorial Parkway that runs along it comes down to our site. We have sidewalks along most of the parking locations and our three parking lots itself. The small loading zone here and the bike path. <coughs> our uh, site has a mac our roadway has a maximum design slope of six percent and a design speed of twenty five miles per hour. The uh, you can see the different slopes. This is from zero to two percent and these are within that range. <clears throat> this was uh, the the slope was determined based on uh, considerations of cost and paved area, while also maintaining desirable access to the site. Our uh, roadway was designed <clears throat> using Auto Turn. Auto Turn is a CAD program that allows you to uh, run different design vehicles along a roadway in order to test the particular design. First, our roadway was uh, built using hand calculations, and then refined later using Auto Turn to limit and highlight uh, problem areas. So using auto turn, we ran a vehicle along this course and tested the loading dock. Two vehicles were tested. The first vehicle was a East Providence ladder truck for the fire department. And then the second vehicle was a Cisco truck represented by a W50 design vehicle. The Cisco truck was determined to be more demanding and as a result is the design vehicle shown here. The vehicle comes along and this is the uh, vehicle itself. Access, and it can also come along here, pull in, enter and exit the uh, loading dock and leave successfully. The pavement design was based upon East Providence standard details. <clears throat> the roadway will be uh, 15 feet wide on each side with 12 foot lanes and three foot shoulders. We'll utilize granite curbing and have three foot wide grass strips and sidewalks in certain locations as mentioned earlier. <clears throat> the roadway uh, cross sections are also specified by the East Providence standard details and are listed here. The sidewalk and uh, granite curbing <clears throat> were selected using similar methods. Granite curbing was selected based on uh, analysis by RIDOT on uh, the cost analysis for uh, granite curbing versus precast concrete. 
precast concrete has a shorter service life than the granite curbing, and as a result, is more expensive over a longer life cycle. And so we selected granite curbing on the uh, analysis that showed that granite curbing is actually a cheaper alternative and more desirable aesthetically. The pavement <coughs> that was uh, specified by East Providence was tested. First, we calculated the minimum requirements for the pavement using the uh, anticipated soil material and for the fill, and then the uh, expected equivalent single axle load for our site based on a typical site of our size and characteristics. This gave us a uh, design requirement of 2.4 for the strength number using a nomogram here. We checked the uh, design uh, from East Providence by multiplying the particular layer coefficients for each pavement layer with the design thickness and some of those totals to get a uh, <coughs> strength number 2.84, which exceeds two point the minimum requirements, which shows our road is sufficient in design. For our parking, we have uh, two scenarios, the restaurant and the two boutique shops. The restaurant will be supplied by the main parking lot and street parking, while the uh, boutique shops will be supplied by street parking and loading zone. This design was intended to minimize the paved area as it shares the parking between the two locations and decreases the overall size of the main parking lot. <clears throat> Finally, our bike path was designed following uh, ASHTO standard uh, recommendations. It is going to be 12 feet wide with 2 feet of graded gravel on either side. It will have a 2% cross slope <clears throat> for drainage and then uh, pavement thicknesses of 1.5 inches of surface course and 1.5 inches of base course followed by a gravel sub base. This uh, pavement design is allowed for emergency vehicle access along with the, w the width and the uh, other specifications are allow for emergency vehicle access while also meeting ADA requirements and providing excellent pavement surface for our uh, pedestrians and bike, uh, bike riders and giving views of the East Province waterfront. Next is uh, Jack Keating and talk about the structural design elements of our site. Thanks, Nat. I'm uh, Jack Keating. I uh, worked on the structural design of our uh, project. Um, requested on the site was a restaurant. Uh, it was a full year restaurant uh, to host 125 patrons. Uh, it also included a full-service bar. Uh, the design would be similar to the pump house in Wakefield, Rhode Island, with granite siding. Um, also requested were two seasonal boutiques, each having 1,000 square feet. And the codes I used to design these buildings were ASE 7 from 1995 and Rhode Island State Building Code. Um, the roof design, I chose to use a decking and joist system. Uh, I found the loads in ASE 7 in the Rhode Island State Building Code. And with these loads, I calculated the, the uh, governing load case. And with these low cases, a decking was selected. And for the uh, restaurant, the dining section, we wanted to have a peaked roof, so we made use of a gable joist to make this happen. For the kitchen, we used a normal joist as well as normal joist for the boutiques. And to analyze these structures, I used STAD. Uh, both the restaurant and the boutiques were modeled in STAD. And with these models, I was able to analyze the, uh, with the, uh, with the loads found in ASC 7 and the Rhode Island State Building Code. I used a find an element roof, uh, find an element roof, uh, find an elements on the roof to uh, transfer the loads to all the members for an analysis. Uh, after analysis, as an example, uh, you can see on the bottom is the restaurant. Um, the members are able to be selected. Uh, for the columns, I used eight by eight by six tubes and for the bracings, I used T-sections, 4 by 14, and three different types of beams were used, W8 by 28, W14 uh, by, <clears throat> by 61, and W12 by 30. And this is a possible floor plan for the restaurant. The uh, kitchen is located in the rear, so no views are obstructed from that. Easy entrance into the dining section, as well as the uh, bar right here. And the bathrooms will be located in the rear to avoid obstructing any views. And the views would be located in the bottom here or to the left over here. For the slab design, a slab uh, was made for both the restaurant and the boutiques. And it was a slab on grade and welded wire fabric was used for reinforcement. After calculations, uh, W2.5 by W2.5, uh, 3 inch by 3 inch uh, welded wire fabric was selected. Uh, the joints would be no larger than 20 by 20. And uh, is a cross section right here. The welded wire fabric is right in the middle right here, and there's also additional reinforcement in the perimeter uh, to number four bars. And now Matt's going to take over for closing remarks. Thank you. 
We're confident that our site layout has met not only our project goals, but as well as the design criteria that was laid out by our uh, development uh, owner. And we feel that we've planned out each design element using our previous engineering knowledge, the design codes, as well as other regulations that were laid out by state or government uh, regulations. This project wouldn't have been able possible without us thanking some people. We'd like to first thank the department and all staff who helped us there, as well as John Steer, Mark Fisher, and from GZA, we would like to thank Russ Morgan, Rick Carlone, Matt Page, and from Dupree Engineering, we'd like to extend a big thank you to Len Bradley and Jason Klo and the rest of our design mentor firm from Dupree Engineering. And if anyone has any questions, we would be happy to take them. Oh, sorry. The footing to the retaining wall is showing you 18 feet wide. Yes. That's awfully, awfully, awfully big footing. I would be, you know, at some point it stops functioning as a footing. When you have a wall that's 18 feet high, mm -hmm. you have an 18 foot wide footing. The length of that was actually um, caused by we had an additional 500 pounds per square foot lowering on the top of the wall due to any uncertainties for what the uh, top layer will be used for. You're not going to handle that by just making it pretty wide. Well, the only thing that was failing was sliding, and that was what we came to the conclusion of without having, for ease of construction, instead of having to add a key or something like that. Making an 18 foot wide footing is an easy on the slab design, talk about yep. the reinforcing at the midpoint of the slab. Yep. You want that reinforcing below the neutral axis. Yep. The one in the area that's in tension. Yeah. And that's not going to happen at the midpoint. Mm. It is on grade too. Mm. It, it's on. It's a slab on grade too. So, but yeah. Mm. You still want to be yeah. below the midpoint. Yep. And grease trap for the rest of the show just as you need it. Typically, you want that just in part of the kitchen, because you have all your other sanitary releases, et cetera, that you don't want coming through that grease trap. Yeah, that was just put up as a representation, because the, obviously the client or whoever takes over the restaurant is going to put it wherever you know it fits best. Typically, we'd be inside and leave the two lines. And I know you weren't allowed on the side. Anybody look at an aerial photo to see what your site views are actually across? Across? Yeah, yeah, yeah. you're looking right at yeah. some more oil tanks. You may not want to protect those site views. Yeah. you got scrap metal piles about 60 feet high, saw piles. Uh, we tried to rotate the yes. uh, uh, restaurant so you could see away from that. So <laughs> 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 Are there any other questions for this Okay, thank you very much. I don't know, man. I can't feel my face. <laughs>
Okay. Okay, next we have Earthwide Engineering Enterprise, E cubed. <laughs> All right. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Shane Taylor, and I'm proud to present to you the Veterans Memorial Parkway site. Um, and I would like to introduce my team uh, real quick, please. This is Tyler Mason, the AutoCAD specialist of the group. This is uh, Joe Pasilico, the environmental uh, considerations. This is Gentry Andrews. He took care of the transportation considerations of the group. Sean Likens, he took care of the uh, retaining wall considerations and some geotechnical aspects. This is Akita Toon. He took care of the foundations. And finally, uh, Joseph Wilkins, he took care of all the structural aspects of the presentation. Now, um, for Veterans Memorial Parkway, a brief site description. Um, you know, it's located across from the Lions Ave intersection and uh, 431 Veterans Memorial Parkway. Um, the site is long and narrow with a dramatic gradation, so obviously there were problems considering around this. And um, there were abandoned structures and on-site utilities to take into consideration as well. Um, the site has a western waterfront view, so it has a lot of potential for uh, beautiful sunsets and the like like that. And um, here's a few pictures of the site. Um, here are some abandoned structures and uh, adjacent properties for the site. Um, as you can see over here, there's the uh, <clears throat> abandoned pier and retaining wall that's currently existing. Um, and there's also uh, retaining walls existing on location as well. Um, the site's also located across from a uh, golf course and a few commercial developments. And a bike path is located right adjacent to Veterans Memorial Parkway along the entire site. Here's our proposed development for our, uh, for our project. As you can see, we have a roadway curve that extends from Lions Ave and has um, safe curves for uh, visitors to access our site. Um, and then the site also splits off in a north and south direction into two parking lots, one over here for the boutiques and one over here for the restaurant. As you can see, the restaurant's slightly larger and um, supports as it supports a private uh, parking lot for the restaurant. Um, over here is the uh, boutiques aspect of the site. These are both two stories high, as well as the restaurant is two stories high. And the, um, and the carousel extends from the, uh, from the parking lot over from the boutiques to basically for uh, nice commercial development for visitors to enjoy themselves. We also have retaining wall aspects along the site, which um, which uh, protect the site from a dramatic gradation drop from 38 feet to 20 feet. And these are the upper retaining walls for the site, and they're the largest. And um, as, the site, as the site continues, there are lower retaining walls for the site, which uh, protect the bike path for the site as it extends down the lower aspect. And as you can see over here, there's an interaction between the pier, bike path, and the revetment for the site as well. Um, also, there's infiltration basins along the site to take care of all the water runoff and surface storms, and there's also um, gradation that we'll talk about soon. And here's um, a Google SketchUp for a 3D analysis of the site. And um, as you can see, the, uh, the gradations exposed, and you can see the, uh, the retaining walls and all the developments as well. Um, so right now, I'd like to give it to uh, Tyler Mason to talk about the gradation changes of the site. Good afternoon. My name is Tyler Mason, and I am the Site Civil and AutoCAD Specialist. Um, I concentrated um, basically on the grading for the site. It was a long process, which uh, generally started as deciding what the regulations were that we had to meet. Uh, these included FEMA um, flood elevation of 16 feet, ADA minimum slope of 3%, and things like uh, CRMC buffer zone and things like that. Um, the next step was deciding on control points. And um, one of them was the top of our site where it meets the existing grade. That's where our road comes down. The grade there is 27 feet. So obviously from our site, we had to start the grading at 27 feet and grade downwards. Um, all keeping in mind what the view is going to look like, what our site's going to look like, and um, keeping in mind the water aspect of it, which now Joe is going to talk to you about. I'm Joe Basilico, and I. Uh I worked on the uh, stormwater design for this site, and my main goals for this site was to meet the minimum standards set forth by the stormwater design 
Rhode, Rhode Island stormwater design and installation manual, and I was going to design for a 24-hour Type 3 10-year storm. My stormwater design process, and here's my schematic, I basically broke the site up to three zones, Zone 1, Zone 2, and Zone 3, and had three infiltration basins which correlated with each zone. Uh, to run uh, how the water ran through Zone 1, the water, let's see how to do a panel. The water first ran from this catch basin into this swale. As the water ran through down through the swale, it reached this drop manhole on the top of the retaining wall and went to this main manhole. As it went down the series of manholes, it reaches this weir manhole, or as called a splitter, which sets the first flush into the catch basin of the parking lot and bypasses the rest out to the outfall into East Providence River. As the water goes through the catch basins, it goes all the way down and into the infiltration basin right here. The same process goes for zone three and zone two. As though there's not many manholes, all the water flows down into this infiltration basin and the water from this restaurant flows through this well to this infiltration basin. The inf infiltration basins work as, as this. The profile right here for the infiltration basin shows the inflow right here. As it goes through the sediment four bay, it uh, cleans out all sediment that would be involved in the water and goes over the overflow spillway into the ponding area. In the ponding area, the water recharges through infiltration, as well as having an overflow right here, which makes sure that the water does not exceed the elevation of the flood. And now for the wastewater design. My goals were to design a uh, grease trap for the proposed restaurant, which was 10 gallons per minute, locate the discharge point for the sewage, and develop a network to convey the wastewater to the discharge, discharge point. Here's the uh, wastewater design schematic I put forth. And basically, I show each shop right here has a 0.1 gallons per minute flow of waste, and the restaurant has a 8.6 gallons per minute flow. As you can see, all the elevations are above 20 feet for each shop and restaurant, and our discharge point was located at 5 feet elevation right here. So I used 12-inch PVC conduit to convey all waste into that discharge point, and I used Bentley sewer gems to uh, do the calculations for that. Now I'd like to send it over to our transportation engineer, Gentry Andrews. I'm Gentry Andrews. Um, I was in charge of the transportation aspect of the project. Um, the main con design considerations for the transportation were uh, the parking, horizontal alignment, the vertical alignment, and uh, the pavement structure. Um, as for the parking design, the, the first consideration was the capacity requirements. These uh, capacity requirements were taken from the East Providence zoning requirements, and uh, ADA accessibility guidelines um, were used for the handicapped spaces. Um, for capacity requirement considerations, uh, the things that need to be considered were the restaurant, which included the number of patrons that were expected to be at the restaurant and the number of employees. For the boutique shops, it was based on the ground floor area and the number of employees, and also had to be taken to, to, into consideration the bike path. Um, use, I used um, an existing lot to represent the number of spaces that would be used. All right, here's a, here's a parking schematic. Uh, the one on the right, this is, uh, that's for the, the restaurant. It contains 81 shops, I mean 81 spaces, and the left is the boutique, which has 39 spaces. Um, the spacing is uh, 190 square feet, 10 by 19 feet. Uh, ADA requirements required two, two spaces for, sh um, for lots between uh, 25 and 50 spaces, which is shown in the boutique shops, and for the parking for the boutique, it's a four for 100 to 100, 150 spaces. Um, for the horizontal curves, um, it was based on the policy of geometric design of highways and streets. Some of the design considerations were uh, design speed, the friction factor, super elevation, the minimum uh, curve radius, and stopping site distance. Um, the minimum radius equation I used from Ashto, it's uh, velocity over um, 15 times the super elevation max plus the 
fr friction factor max. Uh, velocity for, for the site I assume to be 15 miles per hour. And uh, super elevation I assume to be zero due to low velocity and low traffic volume. And the F max came from uh, exhibit 511 um, right down there. It shows for 15, 15 miles per hour design speed, it would be a, a side friction factor of 0 0.3, which um, that calculated a minimum radius of about 60, 60 feet. Um, for stopping site distance for uh, a design speed of 15 miles per hour, it required a design of 80 feet. Uh, here's uh, my horizontal curve. This is the curve leading down from the top of the site to the, the, uh, the top of the access road into the entry of the site. Um, the first curve had a radius of 70 feet, second curve radius of 72 feet, and third curve radius of also 70 feet. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, vertical curve was also based off of the ASHTO policy of geometric design and highways. Uh, some of the design considerations were uh, design speed, radius of curvature, algebraic difference in grades, and the minimum length of curve. Um, these are for a crest curve for MASHTO. For a design, uh, for a radius of curvature, it had to be um, three for 15 miles per hour, or uh, seven for 20 miles per hour. And for a sag curve, it's uh, 10 and 17. So basically, what I did to calculate the minimum length of curve is I took my difference in grades and multiplied it by um, the radius of curvature to get a minimum uh, minimum distance of the curve, which would be based off the stopping site distance, and uh, Came up with here's my vertical alignment. It starts off at a three percent slope. Well, starts off at a three percent slope at the sixty foot elevation and goes for a, a thirty foot curve and into a seven percent slope. And uh, from the seven percent slope, it has an eighty five foot sag curve leading to a two percent slope. The two percent slope was to um, for the access to if anyone was to put anything in the the site next door, then uh, they would be able to tie into it. Um, and then leads to a 35 foot crest curve into a 6% slope, which leads to a sag curve of 137 feet, which leads into the site with a total length of 638 feet. Uh, as for the pavement design, um, as for the pavement design, uh, it was, um, this is the typical pavement design for the City of East Providence Department of Public Works. And um, the pavement structure consists of uh, three inches of asphalt concrete and six inches of crushed gravel base and nine inches of gravel base. The road width was chosen to be 20 foot lanes as to accommodate the design WB50 truck that was to make it down the curve. And uh, now uh, Sean Likens will speak to you about retaining wall design. Uh, once again, <clears throat> my name is Sean Likens, and my main focus on the project was the design of the retaining wall. Uh, for our site, we decided that we were going to use a cantilever retaining wall design. Uh, the upper wall that exists needs to be replaced, and uh, also the upper, uh, upper wall will be necessary because of the steep grades in the site. Uh, the lower wall will be used to separate and elevate the site from the waterfront. Um, we decided that we were going to use a combination of a uh, precast wall and important place footing for the retaining walls. Uh, this method is becoming more common uh, and provides more advantages than just pouring the whole entire concrete for the whole retaining wall. Uh, because it's made, the wall is made off-site, it's considered to be a higher quality. Uh, it requires less site preparation, uh, faster and cleaner installation, and uh, the walls are actually reusable. Uh, these red lines are the location of the retaining wall on site. Uh, you can see there's a break in between for the roadway, and the lower retaining wall will run the span of the entire site. Uh, for the upper retaining wall, we decided that a surcharge load would be necessary because of future development of the site up, uh, closer to Veterans Memorial as ours. Um, the wall also, has, as I said before, it has a break in the midpoint. For it to allow the roadway to enter. Uh, the main feature of the lower retaining wall is the bike path. The bike path actually runs on the outside of the wall and uh, it provides a pretty unique way to of using a bike path by 
being right next to the water. Uh, the path travels under the pier and it uh, <clears throat> provides sufficient clearance for emergency vehicles in case they have to get down to someone that's hurt on the bike path. And also the lower retaining wall elevates the site from the waterfront. For the design aspect, we designed for the upper retaining wall and uh, we just did cross sections for the lower retaining wall because of time constraints. For some assumed parameters, we uh, decided that we should use a well-drained, cohesionless backfill for the upper retaining wall. Uh, internal friction angle, 33 degrees, unit weight of uh, 125 PCF. Uh, for the surcharge load, we decided that 300 PSF would be uh, sufficient because that would take into consideration any snow loads or any cars that would be on the wall. Uh, and for initial height, we decided 18 feet would be enough to satisfy the grid. For preliminary sizing, it was based off uh, available resources and uh, successful walls constructed in the past. It basically uses percentages of the total height and to find uh, like stem thickness at the top and the bottom and the base height. Uh, we checked for overturning. Once we had the retaining wall size, we checked for overturning, sliding, and bearing pressure. Uh, for overturning, overturning moments and writing moments were calculated to have a factor of safety of 2.12, which is higher than the acceptable one of uh, 2.0. For sliding, we found that the factor of safety was not uh, high enough, and we decided that a 15-inch by 15-inch key would be used. <laughs> And uh, to check for bearing pressure, we found the vertical reactions decided that they fell in the current of the footing, and the uh, bearing pressure is at the toe and heel were calculated. So for design, we uh, for the stem design, we took the shear moments due to the lateral earth pressures, uh, found the appropriate reinforcement, took the uh, rotation caused by the lateral earth pressures that caused the heel to be lifted to implement the necessary reinforcement for the heel and the toe design must support the weight of the cantilever slab and the upward soil pressures that we calculated from the bearing pressures and gave the appropriate reinforcement for that. This is a schematic of the upper retaining wall. As you can see we have our reinforcement here. Um, down here we have a drainage pipe that we we're going to use. We considered weep holes, but we decided that uh, they're kind of an eyesore and they, the water actually just runs, comes out right out of the wall and can cause uh, water buildup by the toe. So we decided that drainage pipes would be uh, more efficient. So what we wanted to do was surround the drainage pipe with a coarse, properly drained material and put a porous mat between the wall and the soil layer. Um, for the upper retaining wall, we decided that an eight inch pipe would be sufficient and for the lower retaining wall a six inch pipe. And to talk about the foundation aspect here is how <clears throat> Hi, my name is Hakeem and I was responsible for designing the uh, foundations for, for, the, for the site. I see uh, we got my favorite geotechnical engineers in the front row here so I bet you guys take it easy on <laughs> um, The first thing I considered was doing spread footings but we actually had 18 columns in our, in our, in our restaurant so when I started designing the spread footings, I noticed that the base was, um, they were really close to each other, so I ruled that out. The next thing um, I looked at was the pile footings because of some subsurface conditions. I'll get into that in a second, but later on we decided that that wouldn't be the best bet. So, Matt Foundation was. I got bored when I was explaining. All right, um, rule them as a civil engineer. If you ever have over 50% of the building area, um, covered with the footing, your, better, your best bet is to use the mat foundation, so that's one of the reasons that, that we picked that. Secondly, um, the mat foundation is effective in distributing building pressure over a large area, and because we have so much columns and so much <coughs> pressure acting on our foundation, that was another reason that we thought that the mat foundation would, would make sense for us. Um, I alluded to earlier, there, were, there are some subsurface conditions that we were worried about. Um, the top layer was about 10 feet of a, of a gravel, which was 125 pounds per cubic foot. That was good to build on, but underneath that, we had a silt that was about 105 pounds per cubic foot with a friction angle of about 28 degrees. And when we looked at the, uh, the settlement for that, we realized that over time, um, 
that the settlement it, would, it wouldn't work. I think there was a, a void ratio of about an average of about 0.7. So I know stock stock buy alluded to it earlier, but there was a um, a minimum settlement of about three inches and the maximum settlement of about 14 inches. So we said that that wouldn't make any sense. However, we didn't want to go the the deep um, the pile foundation the pile road just for the simple fact that because we have so much columns, we felt that it would be just more cost effective cost efficient to to excavate this way. Um, we used the ASD regulations when the, um, calculating everything. However, when we, were, when we were solving for the loads for the settlement, we actually used the, the largest load that we had in the column, so we wanted to kind of overcompensate to make sure that there wasn't any settlement. That was about 65 kips, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Um, in the restaurant, there was, because the mat is so large, there was two moments, actually, so we had to solve for um, the effective width of the mat foundation, but it wasn't too much of a problem. And right, into the foundation design, um, we actually have the, the depth of the foundation at about two feet, but after we excavate the soil, we planned on um, so that the food we were gonna place it with would be free of Jane, therefore it would be okay to have it above the first level. Above the first step, I'm sorry. Like I alluded to earlier, if you look up the top, there was two moments in the restaurant foundation, however, the boutique foundation was loaded concentrically. Um, when, we saw, when we saw for the essential loads, it was in the can, therefore we weren't too concerned with overturning or sliding. Um, when we saw for the, the, we used Vestix equation to solve for the ultimate capacity, and we had an allow, allowable bearing capacity of about 25 kips for the boutique and about 55 kips for the restaurant. The bearing pressure was about 0 0.6 kips for the restaurant <laughs> and about 1.89 um, Kips for the boutique, therefore, the factor of savings was over 100 feet, so that wasn't a problem that we had to worry about. And calculating the immediate settlement of, of both came out to 0 0.9 inches and 0 0.5 inches, respectively, therefore, the settlement wasn't just for us to worry about either. Now I'll be passing it along to Joe Wilkins to talk about the structural aspect. Hi, my name is Joe Wilkins, and I did the structural aspect of the design. Oops. Which one do I press? Um, as the architectural and structural engineer on the project, my overall design process was to first um, architecturally render it um, for the um, was to render it based on the client's wants for how it looked and basically the sizing of the building. Then I determined the loads based on ASCE 7, and I also um, figured out the configurations for it. Once I had that, I could go on to design the gravity load resisting system. And then after I had picked all my members and uh, beams for the two-story frame, I would go on to the lateral load resisting system. I would check it using a computer software. And after I was done with all that, I would go on for other considerations such as slab design and anchoring and tension and compression cords. Um, the main um, codes and regulations that I used were ASE 710 for design loadings. I used NDS supplement and, com and commentary 2005 for the wood structure the boutiques, and I used ASC steel construction manual for the restaurant. Um, the main loads that I designed for were the gravity loads of dead, live, and snow. Uh, <coughs> um, the loads, the lateral loads that I designed for were wind and seismic. Um, when I was first um, doing the lateral load resisting system, I had to make a decision between which which lateral loading would be um, governing for this site, and and because I picked a steel framing system that didn't require seismic detailing, and the connections for the frame were not based on actual were not based on the actual demand of seismic loading, it was only based on um, whatever the whatever the demand was. Um, 
generated at that point, regardless of whether it was seismic or wind. Because the overall wind share was greater than the overall seismic share, I chose to go with the, I chose that wind was critical, critical section. Um, selection of building materials for the restaurant, I used steel because of the wide open areas that the wide open spacious areas for dining. In the boutiques, I chose wood with um, minimal steel. I used for um, open shopping area. I only used um, one, beel, um, one beam and two columns to support them. The restaurant uses X bracing in the north-south direction and moment frames in the east-west to accommodate the window demand. The, boutique, the boutiques use shear walls in both directions. And now, and these are final renderings of what the building should look like. And now, Sean will finish off the site. Thank you, Joel. That was good. All right. To um, talk about the pier and revetment aspects of the site, here's a cross section of the lower retaining wall and the uh, revetment in the pier for our site. And this is um, this is the bike path here as well. And this is um, roughly about an eight to uh, 15 foot clearance for emergency vehicles for the uh, for the bike path, and um, so then basically, um, so basically um, the pier extends uh, 150 feet into the water, and the revetment is to uh, obviously save our site from uh, potential storms for our site as well. And here, um, here's the timber pier for our site. Uh, for the design for that, we use two by ten deck members. Um, this was basically just chosen off of you know building codes and such like that. For the uh, four by eight stringer members, we chose those, and um, we also chose eight foot wide decking for uh, for clearance for uh, pedestrians as well. Now the uh, the span length for the stringers is 15 feet long, and um, this was this was checked doing maximum deflections and, and calculations like that. And um, the two center stringers was needed for reinforcement for the uh, for the timber pier. The maximum deflection didn't check out for that, so we need to reinforce that. Um, the shoreline and slope protection design, we, we use Transit 18 for, uh, for the city of East Providence. The H1% is 5.42 feet. That's from the maximum crest subtracted by the, uh, from the minimum wave divided by 0.7, we got 5.2. The significant wave height um, was also calculated. Um, and then from, from the significant wave height, you multiply that by 1.46 to get um, a 10% wave height of 4.16 feet, which is necessary for the diameter of the stone. And once the diameter of the stone is calculated, you can, uh, you can all, um, you know which, which uh, ride out grades to use for the revetment. And then the armor layer thickness is also uh, determined from that as well, from, uh, from a long equation. Um, so in conclusion, uh, we're proud to present the uh, East Providence Waterfront Site. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, we're thankful to uh, use our engineering skills to uh, meet all Mark Fisher's needs for a beautiful waterfront location. And uh, I'd like to give a special thanks to uh, Brian Associates and Steer Engineering, which uh, guide us in our engineering process. Uh, Michael Desmond and David Hogwarts, who is in here right now, we'd like to give a special thanks to, along with Susan Bachner and uh, Miss Patricia Steer. Um, as well as Professor Bradshaw, he helped me out a lot too with the sediment calculations, so special thanks to him. Absolutely, all you URI staff. And we thank you for being here, and we would like uh, open for questions at this time, please. On the road design, you want people to drive at 15 miles per hour. You have to design it at a higher speed. The difference between the speed and the speed. When you're 15 miles per hour, so the kid's going to drive at 25, you may want to design it at 40, and then post it at 15. So you always want to have that built in safety factor. You have a design at 15 miles per hour, and that's tough to drive. Um, the 8.6 gallons per minute for the kitchen flow, the sanitary waste, it's probably low for a restaurant. Kitchen. Yeah, I got that from the uh, North Carolina uh, the restaurant manual, that estimated flows. Estimated barbecue. Yeah. <laughs> and I kind of understood how you're going to capture the first flush. Right. I'm not sure how you're going to isolate it, so that's all you're catching. Well, we use the weir and the mantle. 
and the weird man as the water flowed into the manhole, it, had, it catches the first uh, flush in one, and as that fills up, it overfills into the other five bags. How do you keep additional water from going in? When you try to capture the first flush, you want to isolate it. Right. So I know how you're going to get the first flush. But it seems you're also going to get continuous flow from all the flows after that. So you need to figure out a better method on that. And the revetment, like the diameter stones. Yes, sir. <coughs> Those are pretty big stones to be hoisting in <laughs> yes, sir. with a crane. I believe that's a, uh, a general gradation, so there'll be smaller stones, but it is uh, fairly large. We need five, probably five a big crane for that. Eight, nine yards. Okay. That's a throwing yep. cars in there. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, question to Zachary. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> delay to payment design. What was the design vehicle? And also, I, you use the same East, uh, east Province uh, uh, cross-section, center cross-section. Yep. But it seems to me the previous group and then your orientation, they are not the same. Not the same. Why is that? You are using different standard or uh, old version? I, uh, I know could you I, explain the difference? I used the, the one I used was uh, Standard commercial cross, uh, roadway cross section for the city of East Providence. That was from the uh, city of East Providence? Yes. But the previous group showed us uh, different uh, the uh, synchronous and cross section. I don't know which one is correct. <laughs> I mean, the data you can test, okay? Overall, good presentation. I I might, might be because there's, there's, a design for, there's a design for a residential as well. So did you figure out the uh, ESO? Um, I calculated and estimated ESAL. Um, it wouldn't really affect the, since it's such a low volume road, it wouldn't really not think it would affect the, the pavement structure based on the design. Okay, thank you. Anyone else have a question? Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, while they're changing, we had a question come in from me. Um, you can answer that. This is, this is from my person at um, Seth Mike Carnival. Um, he emailed him a question. Let me read it to you. You indicated that the consolidation of the underlying silt layer would result in a settlement of 2.1 inches under the restaurant. Is that amount of settlement tolerable for the proposed structure? If it is not, how do you intend to remediate it? Pre-consolidate with surcharge, large footings to reduce bearing pressure, etc. What was the OCR for the silt layer? Is it over-consolidated or normally consolidated? Do you want to answer that up by the podium for a second? Oh. That's for the previous group. <laughs> the people that just came in and you that are all right, uh, let me see if I remember all the uh, parts of this question. Um, in terms of the settlement, uh, we calculated it out. We determined that most of the settlement will happen while we're grading the site. Um, so any problems with differential settlements will be fixed during grading before the building, before the structures are, erect, are erected. So there was not a problem with the serviceability of them. Um, as for the OCR of the silt layer, I'm not sh quite sure of that. Um, I do believe we just took it to be a um, normally consolidated silt layer at this point, just as worst case scenario. Okay, first, uh, the email's back, I'll let you know. Thank you. <laughs> Good answer. So we're hoping to do Skype, but maybe next time. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay, so we have one more question. Okay, you guys all set? Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Okay, the the final, the final group is Ocean State um, Engineering.
Good evening and thank you for joining us for our senior capstone presentation. We are Ocean, Ocean State Engineering. My name is Kristen Mena and I'm the project manager as well as the AutoCAD specialist. How are you doing? I'm Kyle Southern. I'm the geotechnical engineer. My name is Ryan Verona. I'm the structural engineer for this project. Uh, Steve Vasconcellos, transportation engineer. John Hampton Ward, environmental engineer. Our site is located in East Providence, Rhode Island, off of Veterans Memorial Boulevard and across from Lions Ave. Our site is approximately 65 feet at the top and down to um, sea level at the bottom. It's 2,000 feet long by approximately 200 feet wide. Um, we are working with a 16-foot floodplain and a 50-foot buffer zone. To meet our clients' requests, we created one main road off of Veterans Memorial Boulevard, which will be across from Lions Ave. Um, then the main road leads to a parking lot for all the patrons of our site and an access road for emergency vehicles. We also created a bike path which runs the length of the site and connects into the East Bay bike path. We have one restaurant located in the central part of the site, two boutiques with an out a public restroom, and two ghost boutiques for future, future building. We also have a pedestrian tunnel leading from the top tier of the site to the tier with the carousel. Now I will turn it over to Kyle Southern, our geotechnical engineer. Thanks. Thank you, Tristan. Um, like she said, I'm Kyle Southern. I'm the uh, geotechnical engineer. So, <clears throat> As Kristen outlined, we have three major aspects that pertain to geotechnical engineering. First off, we have this upper reinforced concrete retaining wall. And then we have a wall running through the middle of our site right here that's a mechanically stabilized earth wall. And then we have a pedestrian tunnel here. I'll, I'll get to the why we have a tunnel. Um, first off, first off, uh, as everyone else has mentioned, there is a silt layer and there's a small clay layer. So what I thought we would do, seeing how we weren't giving, given a timetable or a budget, uh, we would preload the site, especially where the buildings are, through the middle of the site. And then we would excavate for, to build the mechanically stabilized earth wall. So here's a uh, cross-section a general cross-section of our site showing the elevation changes from the retaining walls. Right here we have a uh, elevation at the top of the retaining wall of 32 feet and this is a 10-foot reinforced concrete retaining wall so it brings us now down to 22 feet of elevation and then we have the upper tier of our site and that will run and include the restaurant and the boutiques and will run to our mechanically stabilized earth wall here which is 12 feet tall and the top elevation at the mechanically stabilized earth wall is 19 feet and it will bring us down to 7 feet. And then at the 7 feet, that's when it meets up with the, uh, the riprap and goes down into the water. So first I'm going to talk about the reinforced uh, concrete retaining wall which is at the top of our site. Here's a cross section of our concrete retaining wall as, along with a rebar diagram. Like I said before, it's uh, 10 feet tall. The heel and toe thickness is 1.5 feet. Total base length is 11 and a half feet. At the bottom of the stem, we have 18 inches uh, width, and at the top we have a one foot width. Also, this uh, it's used it's built. I'm sorry, excuse me. It's built with 4 KSI concrete and 60 gauge steel rebar. As you can see, we were, trying, we were going for easy constructability, so we tried to use bars that would also be used in other parts of the site. So we have number nine bars at 12 inches running longitudinally, and then we have number five also at 12 inches running transverse, and then we use the same bars down in the, in the base of the concrete retaining wall. Next, I'm going to be talking about our lower wall, which is the mechanically stabilized earth wall. Here's a cross section of our mechanically stabilized earth wall. I chose to go with a 15 uh, pounds per square foot geo, I mean 1,500 pounds per square foot geo grid, because it allowed us flexibility with the loads and other stuff that may influence this wall. Like before, this wall is 
12 feet tall. It's going to have a concrete leveling pad. Uh, the horizontal spacing between the geogrids is going to be four feet, and that was uh, calculated using equations and guidelines from the Federal Highway Administration uh, manual. Also, the retained soil right here will be a structural fill, which will, which will be free draining, uh, have a specific weight of about 125 pounds per cubic foot and a friction angle of 36 degrees. And at this portion of the wall over here, it will be stepped because we have a nice gradation right here along bringing this part, this portion of the wall up to 19 feet. Once the wall gets to, and the, each step will be 16 and a half feet. So 16 and a half feet linearly will, will run along the wall and then you'll lose a foot in elevation. And you, that will happen until the wall is three feet tall and then once the wall runs for 16 and a half feet at a, at a three feet height, then it will be terminated and the slope will be wrapped around to make a nice gentle rise to 19 feet. And last but not least, we have a tunnel, a pedestrian tunnel. It's going to be pre, uh, prefabricated. The dimensions are 20 feet, uh, 20 feet long, 14 foot wide, and 12 feet tall. Now, the pedestrian tunnel is right here on our site. And the pedestrian tunnel allows the, the patrons who come to our site access to the carousel, which is down here, uh, who are on the upper portion of the site, access to the carousel without blocking the bike path. So it allows people to continue biking and walking so that there's no interruption. You don't, you don't have to go around or anything like that. And one of the main things I, I tried to do with designing these walls and designing all of this was constructability. So that's, that's one of the main things I focused on. And here we have uh, examples of our footings that we're going to use. Now these footings will be on each of the columns in the restaurant and the boutique. These are square spread footings. And they're used, they're built, they're, they were designed and built with 4KSI concrete, again, going for a constructability standpoint. And now I'm going to hand it off to Ryan Verone, our structural engineer. Thank you, Kyle. As I said earlier, I am the structural engineer for this site in East Providence. First off, we're going to talk about the restaurant. The restaurant is located right here to the uh, northwest of the parking lot and also there's a pathway that connects the two. This is a rendering that I did of the restaurant to give a nice view of what it potentially could look like. We do have a balcony on the second floor. It is two stories by the way. We have a balcony on the second floor and also an entrance that connects to, the, uh, to a, a walkway that goes to the parking lot. Here we have cross uh, elevations, excuse me, of the restaurant. It is designed using ASCE 7, the 2010 edition. And we used wind exposure category C to deal with 145 mile an hour winds. The importance category that we used was three, and this was due to a larger structure, which gives more occupancy. It is 90 by 75 feet, and it is, uh, like I said, two floors. The first floor could hold about 120 patrons for eating and also 15 at the bar, while the second will have a 100 person occupancy. And that second floor will be used as a function room for small parties, and it is handicap accessible. This is an architectural layout of the first floor of our restaurant. As you can see, we do have two entrances, one on each side. This will be the main entrance come from the parking lot, but because we have walkways connecting to the boutiques on this side of the building, we'll have an entrance there as well. As you walk in, we do have a waiting area here, elevated to the direct right, and also two staircases going to the second floor. This larger back room is the kitchen area, and next to it we do have bathrooms for men, women, and a janitor closet and employee restroom. 
The bar is located down here in the bottom left corner. It can hold about 15 people, as I said earlier. And this is the general seating area for the patrons that come into our restaurant. This is the architectural layout of the second floor. As I said, it would be used primarily as a function room, so we left it mostly open. You would uh, gain access to the stairways or the, rest, uh, the elevator. There's a small bar, so you don't have to go up and down stairs to get, to the, get your drinks. It's mostly just for uh, convenience. We also have restrooms on the second floor. In this back area will be offices or storage, whatever the owner seats fit. This is the outdoor balcony where outdoor seating or lounging would be uh, for the second floor. This is a cross section of our roof and we are using a, a joist system. The joist is 28 inches deep and it is 55 feet long. It will be supported by W sections of steel and it will support the roof which is com uh, made of a composite deck, plywood, insulation and shingles. A joist system was chosen because of the long spans that the restaurant will have to keep the function room open for people to walk around in. This is a small cross section of what the second floor would actually look like. You see here we do have another W section. This particular one I used a uh, uh, W24 section. Um, this also supports a concrete composite deck for the second floor and the, f uh, the floor load above it, which is a, a live load of 100 pounds per square foot. This uh, is the cross section of the slab on grade for the restaurant, which is also the same as the boutique for constructability purposes. Here you see we do have uh, welder wire fabric, which we used at four inch spacings, W3.5 by W3.5 welder wire fabric. And we did use reinforced concrete at the end of the cross section. For the slab on grade, we made sure we had three inches of cover all around and at the bottom to make sure that it was structurally stable. This next image is of this steel layout. It is an elevation of the uh, back side of the restaurant facing the north. We have lateral bracings on each side to help deal with our uh, large wind loads that I said was 145 miles per hour. And we have the vertical members. Every single one of them are uh, hollow steel tub uh, tubing at 8 by 8 inches. And I used all the columns I use this section for all the columns for, again, constructability purposes. The horizontal beams in this image are all W12 by 40, and the lateral bracing is uh, 5 by 5 angles by 1 inch thick. This is a, a steel layout of the side elevation, and again, we use this uh, 5 by 5 uh, L bracing, and all the columns are again hollow steel tubes, eight by eight inches. However, the beams do vary throughout the building to um, hold larger loads and longer spans. For instance, these beams are W24 by 84 to, because they do span longer distances. These ones we're able to keep at um, W12 by 40. And this, you can see, is to support the elevator that we do have going from the first to the second floor. Next, I would like to talk about the boutiques. Again, this is another rendering of what the boutiques could look like. We decided to put two boutiques in one building and also allow a uh, restroom that is accessible to the outside. It was also designed using ASCE 7, and this is a Category 2 building. It is smaller than the other one, and it is 83 by 30 feet. Each boutique is 36 by 30, and that's about, it's a little over 
a thousand square feet. Also, as I said, there is a public restroom accessible from the outside for anybody on the site. This is a architectural layout of our boutiques. As you can see, they are separated by walls and there's an entrance to each and they are pretty much symmetrical. There is a back room for storage and uh, for employees and there are uh, bathrooms in each. This is, the out, uh, this is the public restroom that is accessible outside. You see down here we have the men's room and the women's room. These are the elevations from each side of the boutiques. This is the side with the restroom and this is the side that houses a boutique inside of it. Next I'll be showing you a cross section of the roof and it is similar to the, uh, the second floor of the restaurant. We, did, we used W sections and a concrete composite deck to hold the various loads that will go on um, outdoors on the roof such as a snow load. Next I would like to show you the steel layout. Again we used lateral bracing to uh, make sure any wind loading was taken care of and we used steel throughout the whole structure as, as we did with the restaurant. The columns in this building are uh, also hollow steel uh, tubing like the restaurant but it's much smaller, it's uh, four inches by four inches and the, the beams are uh, W12 by four, uh, excuse me, 30 and the L bracing is the same as the restaurant at uh, five by five. Next I'll show you uh, the, the side elevation of the steel layout, kind of get a, a better look at the, the X bracing and because um, it is 30 feet we decided to put the columns at every 10, 10 foot inter, uh, intervals for easy uh, constructability. And that's all I have for structures. Next I would like to introduce Stephen Vasconcelos for transportation aspect of our project. As Ryan said, I am Stephen Vasconcelos and I did the transportation aspect of this project. As part of the transportation design, I have a roadway, access roads located here and here, and a parking lot, and also I have, some, I have some ADA things to talk about as well. So the things I kind of attacked were the roadways, pavement, parking, bike path, and ADA requirements. So the roadway begins at Lyons Avenue at an elevation of 60 feet. The blue section is the first vertical curve, which is a transition between the 2% that's currently Lyons Avenue and 5% on our site. The red section is 5%, and that's the max. And then the final just goes from 5% to virtually level, entering into the access road. So the inlet roadway has 12-foot uh, travel lanes and 3-foot shoulders, and the max super elevation is 3% and that occurs around the horizontal curves. The pavement structure I used was from the City of East Providence, which was 1.5 I1 surface course, 1.5 I2 binder course, and then a 15 inch gravel base. And then the subgrade soils would be existing soils or structural fill. The curbs are six inches above the pavement surface. And the sidewalks are five feet wide, four inch concrete, and six inch gravel base. So for emergency access uh, as well as delivery, you would, the delivery and emergency access road would be located behind the restaurant as well as the boutiques. The drop-offs may occur. And there's a cul-de-sac located at the end of it so that they may turn around, which is approximately a 102 foot radius. And the design vehicle was a WB50 semi-trailer. Uh, the park, okay. And the second axis is also located in, the second axis is located in the parking lot which you can access the bike path from there in case there's a need for um, if someone gets injured for an ambulance or police. No large vehicles. <clears throat> the 
The parking lot is 115 spaces, and there are six handicap spots, and they are shared use, the boutiques, restaurant, and the bike path. As part of accommodating ADA, um, I've, I've included uh, wheelchair ramps, which are five feet in width, and uh, maximum 12 one slope. And they, one will be located right here at the, rest right at the uh, entrance from the parking lot to the restaurant right near the handicap spaces. And this was a standard detail that I used from the City of East Providence. And for lower tier access, since we have two tiers, which the top tier is at an elevation of 19 feet and the bottom tier is at an elevation of seven feet, I've developed an ADA ramp, which is compliant with all the code to allow access for people in wheelchairs to get to the bottom tier. <coughs> And the bike path runs along the coastline and connects to the existing East Bay bike path. Uh, it's ride on standard. It has 12 foot width with the normal <coughs> cross slope of 2%. Uh, contains a tunnel, as Kyle mentioned. And, and the cross section is actually a total of four inch of asphalt. The top layer is a I2 wearing course and the bottom is an I1 base course and below that is a 12 inch gravel base and the shoulders are 3 feet and the bike lane is 12 feet. So now we'll pass it off to John Hampton to tell us a little bit about water. Uh, as Stephen mentioned, I am John Hampton, and I did the water analysis for this site. The, this one? Thank you. Uh, the main injections that I had to cover were the runoff, the water treatment from the runoff, that was for your impermeable areas, mostly. Uh, catch basins, which were for the road and the parking lot. Sewer lines, which were for the boutiques, the outside restaurants, and the um, outside, I'm sorry, outside uh, bathrooms and the restaurant. <laughs> and erosion control during the construction process. So this is an overall schematic of what I came up with. This is mostly a pipe and swale design. Um, as you can see here, uh, I have four pipes, which are pipes five, seven, which is this one right here, two, and one. Those are the contributing pipes, and they collect the water from the site and put it into these two pipes here, which are pipes three and four. Those pipes are the discharge pipes, pipes, and I'll explain them a little bit further along. Pipe six is the flow pipe from that enters my grit chamber, which I'll be discussing later. And pipe eight is the bypass for that grit chamber in case it gets over flooded or has over demands. So to calculate the runoff from our site, we use TR55. Um, this was a 10 year des design storm. And I divided it up into three areas. Um, the areas are color coded based on that size. And I have the pre construction conditions along with the post construction conditions. And what we had to do is compare the two of them. So, as you can see, nothing really changed except for our work area, which we decreased by approximately um, three, three cubic feet per second. This is due mostly to the improvement of the ground soil, which Kyle mentioned before that we were going to put in some. Uh, free draining material, which would replace the silt. So that improved our, our, our runoff values. So to treat this runoff value, I designed a three-part three, three system. Uh, the first system was the swale system. Second was the grit chamber. And the third was catch basins. Uh, swale system uh, was used along the lower retaining wall. This system um, 
was used mostly for the restaurant and boutiques and the runoff from the lower access road. Um, these, the calculated runoff from that was 18,000 cubic feet per day and this system can handle 20,000 cubic feet per day. The second system I designed was the grit chamber. Um, this was designed to use to service the road and the parking lot. Um, this system can handle 40,000 cubic feet per day, but it's only the amount it needs is only 20. The reason for such a high value is because you need to have a larger capacity for the, the sand, the oils, and stuff like that, so you don't have to clean it out as often. Catch basins we'll be using will be a standard RIDEM catch basin. Um, for the road, they all have 24 inch pipes, and that includes the one for the parking lots, too, connecting them. Uh, the grease chamber, the restaurant, will be producing around 76 um, cubic feet per second, um, sorry, gallons per minute of uh, water that has to be treated. According to the regulations, you only have to treat 50% of that for 24 hour holding time. So the, the tanks we used are, are 40, 50 gallons per minute and can hold 100 pounds of grease. Our wastewater system, um, as I mentioned before, the restaurant will produce 76.33 gallons per minute and the, both the boutiques and the outdoor restaurant each produce both the top one and the future one will both produce around 10 gallons per minute. Um, to convey this system, we use six inch pipes from the boutiques and the, rest, and the restaurant into an eight inch main, which connects into the interceptor pipe. Um, for the soil retention round, I had two separate um, systems. The first system was a sheet pile wall this was to prevent during the construction of that um, in place of uh, pour in place the concrete wall. We had a had a so prevent it from cutting back severely cutting back. We had to put uh, sheet pile walls in. So this would allow us to decrease the cost of moving that soil. Also, because of the high slope along the road, we had to put hay bales and silt. Uh, silt fences along the road to prevent that. And I'm going to kiss it, turn it back over to Kristen Mena for the conclusion. Although we had to overcome many challenges to develop this site, we were able to meet and possibly exceed all of our clients' requests. Overall, the site has become a beautiful waterfront development where there are two retaining walls, a pedestrian tunnel, a restaurant, two boutiques, um, a proposed pier, carousel, uh, main roadway, access road, parking, and um, drainage. Um, we'd like to give a special thanks to all of our engineering profession professors and McGuire Group. We couldn't have done it without you. This would not have been possible. So thank you very much. And we are now happy to take any questions. Yes. Just a yes. <clears throat> I, uh, by Reebok. No advantage to using the same sizes that you can use in other places on the site. Okay. You just design for what you need, and that's what they ship you. Now, it's not like you're going to run and take a piece out of the other wall. Uh, your tunnel concept, I still can't figure out either how you get into it from above now. You don't get into it from above. You only, uh, it's only for the lower portion of the site. It's so the bike path can run through it. And to what does it condemn? The electric by the side of cell. But where does it come back into the site? It's a tunnel to the uh, Can we pull up the picture? It's easier to explain with the picture. It's, it's much. Yeah. I'll just point it out. It's, it's basically just a pedestrian exactly. tunnel on the lower site. If you're walking or riding the on the... Path? Pardon? Is that for the bike path? Yes, the bike path runs through it. 
how do people from up above get down to the there's two there's two stairs. You can either come around this way right here, through the parking lot, down and around past the retaining wall here, or you can access it through this these ramps here or these ramps here, which were designed by so Steve Vasconcell. Also for the restaurant, you show the footage. Yes. There's no steel in there. Yes, there are. are. No, that that was an accident on my on my part. There is rebar and once again it's I believe for the restaurant it is number five used again at twelve inches or or eighteen inches. Eighteen is the max, I remember that. It's in the report. You're off the hook. On the shop. Uh, 18? Yes. With your roof system, do you need columns of every twelve feet? Uh, we we don't maybe need them that uh, spaced apart, but we uh, we use spans of ten every ten feet, and then uh, every twelve feet, like you said, just to make sure that we can hold the load of the snow above it. Design that new roofing system so you can have a shop that is open. Me. Yes. We, uh, we left the shop, both shops all open, and the steel columns um, going from the back to the front of the, of the restaurant, I mean, uh, excuse me, the boutique, are inside the dividing walls of each boutique. Thank you. Uh, Ryan, can you tell me what percentage of your calculations were by hand and by, or by computer? We, I also use STAD, uh, the computer program, but it, it was a iterative process. We, I designed it, uh, uh, an architectural floor plan, and then also put the steel into it. Um, then I calculated the loads by hand, and I inserted those load values into the program, and it told me uh, what uh, forces were coming down. And using those forces, I was able to go into the steel manual and pick out beams. I didn't uh, do the forces by hand, but I did um, use uh, member sizes that were more than enough, so I do know that it is structurally stable. I also used members that fit, uh, fit well together for constructability purposes. For instance, I have eight inch columns that will fit into flanges that are eight inches Wide. Quick question for Kyle. So you, in your MSE wall, uh, you had only three layers of reinforcement, or two layers, I can't remember, but you had like four feet, you had four feet spacing. Was that because you just picked a, a really, a fairly high strength geo grid, or? Yes, uh, yeah, and I just thought it would be easier. I figured um, most of the blocks are a foot tall, so I'd want to get it to a nice round, even foot. I think I tried it with 1,200 pounds per square foot. It came out to uh, something like uh, two and a half, three and a half, something like that. I don't remember exactly. But I figured if we're going to use blocks that are going to be a foot tall um, to try and get the geo good to match up with that. The tunnel runs this way? Yes, the tunnel runs this way. Yeah. It does. Tunnel's a little creepy. Yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> but that's okay. Question for Kyle? Yes. You have a reinforced concrete retaining wall. Yes. You showed the stem in the middle of the footing. Is that correct? That is correct, yes. Why? Um, that was designed using RAM elements. Uh, I chose, it was first designed with RAM elements, and then I checked for factors of safety by hand to just to make sure. I, that's just the way I built it. Sure, it's stable. Yes. Typically, you would move the stem closer to the toe. Right. And have more heel, so you have weight on that. You'll find that your footing will not be as wide. All right. Question for Steve. Yes. Uh, with regard to your to your vertical alignment, vertical and horizontal alignment issues with your road. Uh, I didn't see any detail. Can you share something about the length of your vertical curves and your radii associated with your horizontal curves? Oh yes. Uh, all, the, all three of the horizontal curves that are on there were designed with 100 foot center line radius, according to the ASHTO Green Book. The initial vertical curve is 160 feet long, and the final vertical curve, the final vertical curve, the SAC curve, at the end, is 136 feet. 
and that comes down to 22, and it's 60 on the top. And the rest is 5%. Yeah, so two vertical curves there. Three horizontal. And you said the radio and the horizontal were 100 feet. Center line. Okay, that concludes our presentation. So um, I'd like to definitely thank all the groups. I think the presentations this year were just excellent. I'd also like to thank the judges here that, that gave all their time to do this. And I'd also thank the honors program for letting us use this facility here. So see you next year. Thank you.